have no idea where this will lead us, but I have a definite feeling it will be a place both wonderful and strange. They're here. We're back, baby. Wait, who's they? We are back, baby. Well, clearly we're back because you can't even handle the pronouns right. Hello and Hello. welcome to the wonderful and strange Twin Peaks logcast. Uh, it is so good to be back with, uh, what would you call us? I'm uh, Khalil. Khalil. No, no, no. Like the, you know, where's the blanks to my blanks? I'm, I was going to do that. Oh. I'm Khalil. And with me today is the Redwood Tree and bus accident to my hospital bound, Hank Jennings. Ow. Yeah. Ow. Ow. We're really starting on a high note, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. These past two months have hit us like a, like a Nadine, you know? I mean, it was the holiday, so I'm sorry to hear that, man. We are here today for episode 21 of Twin Peaks, also known as Double Play. Honestly, uh, what an episode to come back to. It is definitely, it, it lives up to its name, to say the least. And it was also written by Scott Frost. Um, Could you remind me of any episodes we've already been covered with Scott Frost? Because as far as I know, Scott Frost is the one who wrote the book of uh, Dale Cooper. Yeah, actually, I did not know that. But uh, no, he wrote episode 15, which we previously had watched. And that was Drive with a Dead Girl. Uh, Okay, so I'm having a... Definitely a hard time. Like, tell me more about this episode of Drive by with a Dead I, Girl. I feel like the consistent theme any. here is is driving, car accidents, death. That seems to resonate with both episode 15 and 21. I mean, was he just, like, ready to go? Just, like, anything that involves death with a vehicle, not, not I'm game for? Not psychologically profile Scott Frost or anything, but... <laughs> I'm two out of two. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Statistics, baby. Uh, and it was also directed by Uli Edel. And have we seen any of Uli Edel's work before? We could not possibly have because this is the only episode of Twin Peaks this German director ever Germanly directed. Oh, okay. Has he directed anything else? He Germanically directed Last Exit to Brooklyn and in a style similar to those in Germany, also directed Body of Evidence. Two movies I've never seen, <laughs> so don't ask me anything about them. I'm imagining that they also involve uh, car accidents well, as well. Well, Last Exit to Brooklyn, you might be exiting Brooklyn via the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And Body of Evidence, there's no body to obtain if it was launched out of the windshield. Unless it's a vehicle's body. Unless it was a body shop. Maybe we should check this out sometime just to see if, like, this was a match made in heaven with Scott Frost, like, perfectly for the amount of accidents <laughs> with vehicles we're going to get into. Yeah, right. Um, but, yeah, so, <laughs> listeners, <laughs> listeners, you, you, you may know, if you've been following us for a while, that uh, recently we had to take a, a short little hiatus for November, December of this past year and up until recently in January. Um, due to some concerns involving the COVID pandemic, we are happy to report that both of us are in good health, mm -hmm. as are our current roommates, as are the people we know in our immediate vicinity. Yes, and personally, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, for listeners that just are tuning in and have not had to worry about the hiatus. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, really wasn't that much of a break, <laughs> was it, guys? How was your weekend or day and your <laughs> short time period? Right. Uh, and we're hoping to get back to our schedule of uploads every other weekend. That is our goal moving forward. That is the big goal, yes. Yes, to continue through Twin Peaks, then go into some of the David Lynch films afterward. Mm-hmm. Juicy. Yes. Any other final last words before we continue into episode 21? Um, I personally am looking forward to a certain juicy moment, but why don't you just lead us into some of the discussion? Ah, huh? yes, the juicy fruit, the gusher at the heart of our hearts. If you count, like, fries, it's flute, fruit. What? Fruit flies. What? Hey, fruit flies! What are you talking about? The juicy fly! I was, no, I was doing the, the gusher's heart. Th I was thinking of hearts because the log lady intro. Oh. That was a segue. Okay. So the log lady uh, made an appearance in this episode. Well, not really in the episode, but before the episode, depending <laughs> outside on. Outside of the realms outside, of the episodes. Yeah. Within a, the universe of Showtime. In a metatextual sense, yes. <laughs> uh, and she asked us some questions about blood and love. Oh, oh boy. Such oh questions as, are blood and love related? Does a heart pump blood as it pumps love, and is love the blood of the universe? So, Professor. Yes. You allegedly have a heart. 
correct? Uh, last time I checked, but unfortunately I haven't seen a doctor in like a decade, so mm. uh, it might have disappeared by then. Do you bleed? Um, a, a few times. Test, okay, we're going to do a little test off, off uh, mic right now and see if the professor bleeds. Okay. Ah! <laughs> All right, so there is some red liquid coming out. Uh, Thank you, Khalil. Uh, I'm glad to report that I do, in fact, bleed. Eh. <laughs> nice. So, what are you, as a bleeder, <laughs> yes. what are your personal thoughts on these questions that the log lady do be asking? Okay. So, it's really, I, I think that this question really does delve deeper into kind of a weird, I may be using the word wrong, metatextual he stole my word. Continue, continue. <laughs> it's mine now. <laughs> Concept of blood. Think about it this way. Mm -hmm. We've been seeing some issues going on in Twin Peaks. In fact, there have been some criticisms, including with uh, our dear old fun Renault brother that said that issues had started coming around with the introduction of John. Cooper. Yes. If we are to consider Twin Peaks in the realm of the conflicts and love with romance like soap operas if we are to like put that into a mold and then add the strange happenings that seem to be surrounding cooper maybe it's a sense that the feeling of this universe and love this meta feeling is as if the body itself is now trying to fight mm -hmm. off against it as if like these blood these red blood cells and the alien inclusion of someone like cooper and in extension, Wyndham Earl and these owls is just a response, if you will. It, it, it's like as if, like, if you were to think of Twin Peaks in the mold of the body of this soap opera and think of a virus saving off an infection, that's the good old element that we <laughs> end up seeing in Twin Peaks where mm. people are now starting to get kicked out or offed because of, well not being welcome in the universe anymore. So like the Taylor Swift song, there is some bad blood. Yep, there is some bad blood, and we need to deal with that right away. So is uh, how does love relate to this, I guess is my question. Because it's like with Cooper, who may be absent from love. He has not accepted love with himself. In fact, he pushes away things like Audrey's advances whenever it comes to the concept of love. Mm -hmm. He is not someone who wants to include himself with love. And if you, the universe is focused on that love and romance in the soap opera narrative... The bad things will likely happen to Cooper and the things around him. So you're saying that FBI agent should totally have dated the high school girl. If he wants <laughs> if he wants to swim through veins like a fish in the sea, uh, uh he will have to accept the world and his accept his desires for love. Okay. Mind you, it is not going to be legal, it is not going to be right by any necessary means, but maybe that is what the universe is telling him. Okay, <laughs> a lot to a lot to parse out there. Uh, yeah, have to do a little bit of open heart surgery to get to the bottom of that one. Yep. Um, for my own take, it's been a little bit more mixed and kind of uh, complex here. We know that cheeky David Lynch is in the background writing these, and sometimes they feel like jabs at the show. This one doesn't necessarily read as a negative thing, unless you take it to the idea that like. He's questioning, or by he, I mean the log lady is questioning if the blood is still pumping, if the love is still pumping. You could argue that maybe there's a heart problem with Twin Peaks, mm -hmm. that it is lost, that heart that no longer is the love pouring in or being pumped in. Yes. I don't know if I agree with that interpretation. I just think it's the first thing that comes to my mind. More obviously, though, this episode uh, exposes the methodology of Wyndham Earl, that he'll do those cuts that then puncture into the aorta. Okay. So you get the sense of blood and pumping and literally the, the stopping of the blood pumping is, you know, the stabity stab that happens in the heart of the heart. Yep. And going along with that, you have the Caroline story that mixes in the love. So it could relate to that. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two that kind of jump to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I'm also left with this feeling of, okay, if it is... If it is the case of the Orta blood pumping murder thing, I'm just kind of like, so what? 
Like, I don't know <laughs> if it really does much for the episode for me. Mm-hmm. This, this, this opening feels a little bit weaker for a Log Lady one. Okay. For my personal taste. For your own personal taste, uh, for blood, yes. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that there's stuff to chew on for this one. It isn't as clear as the others, and I think that's where I kind of enjoy it more than some of the more, I'd say, dr- dramatic ones that we've seen within the past few episodes, you know, with, like, him kind of being not so happy. The question, you know, she asks, is love the blood of the universe, I think is, on one hand, very, like, silly and almost, like, overly simplistic, but then I also find it kind of compelling in another way, too. I'm I'm torn about it because... You might be haunted by your own Wyndham Earl if you keep this up. You know, you're going to be the one thing that these white blood cells have to go after sure. now. These owls. The owls are the white blood cells, hence right. why they're the close white, to the, the same The white color. lodge blood cells, right. Yes. Um, in the red room. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, right. And, you know, the black lodge, the black lung. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Please go on. Uh, but there is something interesting in that, in that basic question of, you know, Is love a supernatural force, basically? Is love something that flows throughout our world, whatever our world might be? Maybe it's just Earth, maybe it's the universe of physical things, or maybe it's the spiritual world as well. Does love resonate? And it kind of reminds me of the sort of things that Major Briggs has been pondering, you know? Yeah. The sort of um, almost metaphysical questions of the intentions of those around him, Mm -hmm. you know, will love triumph in the end? Will it be enough? Mm -hmm. Um, Is love truly the source or is there something darker at the root of things? Now I'm sure we'll be getting into later, but while we're talking about these powers of love, if you will, sure. um, Going off from like the last episode, we've been seeing Leo uh, conjure some strange powers. Is that through the power of love or is there a twisted love like a twisted love? Okay. Yeah, a tainted love, one might say. Uh, do you think that there might be an opposition superpower that is hate, and so hate and love must face well, one another? Well, the question, is the opposite of love hate? Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily know if you have to take that stance. Okay. Because is hate not often fueled by love and fueled by a sort of alternate side of love? It's mm-hmm. not It's not an opposite. It's almost the other side of the same coin. Fascinating. Um, I think you could make an argument that Leo's goodbye wife murder fest that almost <laughs> happened there was the twisting of the knife of his sense of love. And we'll get to the goodbye wife sensation, but I'm very intrigued by the ideas of the power of love. And another powerful element in this episode was the music, which I don't know about you, Professor, <laughs> but I, I came away from this episode having a lot of mixed thoughts about the soundtrack usage. <laughs> So the power of what then? Like, if, if it's as powerful, but at the same time it gives you mixed emotions, what power is that? Uh, it's the power of the good, the bad, and the weird, <laughs> Professor. Fantastic movie, by the way. Yes, yeah. Recently the Professor uh, recommended it to me. It's pretty good. Good Korean film. Yeah. It's like a spaghetti western semi-remake of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sort of adaptation, sort of not... Yeah, I haven't really seen the other film, so I have no idea. The I other just know, film, referring I know. to the massively more popular <laughs> film. Yes. All I know is I like what I like. Fair enough. And I can say that I like a few things with the music in this episode. So, for the good, Professor, and I want you to tell me yes. if my good checks out with you. Go for it. Uh, I like the use of the look away, look away, Dixieland. <laughs> you know? I think that the... I think the presence of it is lightly humorous. I think that the staging before and after makes it its best. Well, uh, when even ben- the lead up instrumentally, you got this sort of Civil War vibes just going on in the room. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, you don't say. Uh, please go on. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the name of the song, but it's the famous one. You know, the do 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 do. You know that one. No, no, keep going. Do. You know that one? Yeah, that one. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for that last note. Else, I'd be completely lost. I'm aware what you're speaking yeah. of. Uh, I think that, yes, it is the before and when Benjamin Horn turns on the fan and starts standing and yeah. starts chanting alongside with uh, good old Dr. Jacoby. I think my favorite part is after as like Dixie dies down and mm-hmm. uh, some more trumpets play in the background. And then we see Major Briggs <laughs> stumble into the sheriff's office at the end of it before passing out on the floor. Most relatable feeling I've ever seen. Honestly, the framing of this music I find to be fantastic. Great. So 
one for one. We check out in the same thing yeah. here. I also really enjoyed the musical accompaniments with Wyndham Earl in this episode. Okay. You have that sort of opening scene where we get the aftermath of Wyndham Earl's appearance. Mm-hmm. The crime murder scene has this sort of eerie flute music going on in the background. I mean, flute is very fitting, and we'll get to the freaking Wyndham Earl flutes later. We will. We will. Professor. But yes, no, and it's so good. Yes, and the chessboard, and then also Leo at the end, the sort of Wyndham Earl eerie flute vibes, they mm. work for me. Stop it. Stop it. You're torturing me. Wyndham Earl. No, no, that's fine. Oh, Wyndham Earl? Chess? Flute? Flute, yes, there flute? we go. Wyndham Earl, flute, that... and together is Ooh. a sandwich I don't want now. That's that's a okay. later sandwich. We're putting a it away for sandwich. lunch. Yes. The term known as later sandwich. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, a now sandwich uh, is Catherine. Can I talk about Catherine? Uh, yes, you may. Uh, Catherine won't upset me. And the totem poles and the triumphant music that plays. Uh, it, it opens up here with this sort of like piano and then it goes into triumphant classical strings that are happening. And it's like at first pretty like quiet, mm-hmm. right? When we're downstairs with Pete and the hot dogs. Yeah, he's just getting a little bit upset. And then uh, they go up and, and then- Catherine has some big reveal for Pete. Yep. And she opens the door. And just suddenly the music booms outward, which only gives either context of one thing, being Uh a great way uh, as a sense of sound direction of just presenting something of importance. Mm -hmm. It really draws the eye. On the more humorous note, on just like he's just blaring like music inside the background and Pete's just doesn't, is not aware of this fantastic classical music. (laughs) Out of character for that Packard. Yeah, the idea that the music was just playing... (laughs) from behind closed doors from that room. <laughs> yeah, so three for three, you agree those are all good uses of the I music. I think that those are all good. Now, I do have a couple ones I didn't like. And you're wrong. So, Leo Johnson, goodbye wife, I th- scene of events. I think that overall, the fact that it is so chaotic, I think that uh, listeners will who have been with us for this whole time will know that I describe Leo as a storm, and the fact that there is Do you a- do that a lot? I, I, I didn't even know you did that. <laughs> Listener, don't feel guilted if you didn't remember that. I, didn't even I, I, do, I do. Like, Leo is a storm, and having a storm of emotions, having a storm of music go about, I think was very fitting for the scene. Mm. Personally, I really enjoyed the way that they handled it, because if, the, if it was just one accompanying track that just sort of either uh, ebbed and flowed with Fortissimo to Piano, could have worked okay. I think that taking this very strange risk with it was the best case scenario. So I say uh, good day, sir, on that. I enjoy it. I feel like I was watching like a children's version of horror. Like I feel like <laughs> I was watching like a bad Goosebumps what? or something. What is wrong with Goosebumps? It, okay, it's, it's the kind of corny sense of suspense that I don't think works well with the feeling of that scene. I don't think it was trying to be silly and cheesy and corny. If it was, then I take it back, because the music gave me that feeling. The visuals didn't, with one exception we might get to later involving the knife that I think is a little hokey. But generally speaking, that whole series of events, I think, was supposed to be genuinely menacing. And there are elements in the visuals that are genuinely very good at creating suspense mm-hmm. but when the music's like bum, 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 you know like in the background <laughs> i'm just like okay can fine. we just have this whole section of you just interpreting all the song we were about to have that but now that you've pointed it out uh, no i'm not gonna do that anymore <laughs> no uh as far as it goes i just, like khalil you and i have been watch, watching a lot of twin peaks we've watched supposedly, a lot of shows supposedly. together supposedly allegedly yeah um I think that there is this weird point where my mindset has blurred the lines between what may be intentional or not, what may be goofy or not, to the point that in this Twin Peaks sludge, I do not know when things get necessarily too goofy. None of us do. Uh, So I think that I've just come to accept a strange mood Twin Peaks has given me, and I'm personally fine with it. Uh, I think that... Yeah, no, I'm good with the more it's, it's strange. It's managed to lure elements. you in in such a way where you've like d- destroyed your critical like faculties. <laughs> I have been uh, lobotomized in the best way by Leo Johnson. We go to the Thank next you. episode and it's just like a Muppet show. <laughs> it's all just puppets and like all the music is played off of like one guy's accordion, and you're just gonna be like, "Wow, amazing, <laughs> so avant garde, uh, so beautiful." Critically acclaimed, uh, six out of five. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second one I wasn't really a fan of isn't because of the music itself. It's because of the usage of it. Yeah. Uh, we had this scene with James and Evelyn. 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 Who's Evelyn? <laughs> it's a cute nickname you've given Evelyn. <laughs> they were in the garage of Jeffrey Marsh, and it was playing a song, and I'm like 90% sure that was Audrey's dance. Mm-hmm. And Audrey's dance 
is an Audrey and, you know, Horn family song, usually. <laughs> I'm not saying it can't be used Excuse- anywhere else, but it's 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 linked to that. Yeah, it is linked to that, but no need to pigeonhole sounds. I, I am a firm believer that if it feels like it goes with the flow, be free to break the structure. It if didn't a go sentence- with the flow to me. I felt like I was in the Great Northern when I was in a man's garage. <laughs> you spend this many episodes developing that music equals Great Northern. Yeah, but- And then you bring me to a man's garage and you play it for me. Hear, hear me out. Like, um, is this, maybe. like, for- Car fans, would this garage not be termed as great? Would this what not be termed as great? Like this garage. Oh, garage. They said yes. grog. Grog. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Tell me, does this grog seem great to you? No. Does this garage seem great to you for someone uh, who's a car fanatic? I, and be- I suppose. And between like the places where Twin Peaks could have taken place, we assume to be towards the north because James has only moved west. Professor. So is this not northern? Professor. And is this not a passage in which James must go through in order to continue his character arc? I mean, Answer me these questions. Arguably, most fans would say, no, he does never need to go through any of this. <laughs> I like it. I, I like it. I, yeah. Uh, and then the last one was a weird, right? The good, the bad, and the weird. Uh-huh. So I only have one here that, that counts as music. Uh, I almost put the radio. We'll get to that later. But that's Quotation not marks and music. Well, radio isn't music. It was just like people playing sports and narrating that. But the, the music one is when we have uh, Norma talking about Hank and now he might have to go to prison, you know, after he gets out of the hospital because he violated his parole. And it has this very like happy go lucky upbeat music in the background. Yeah. And I mixed on this one because like the negative side of me is thinking this is not the right mood at all because this is kind of a serious situation involving Hank and parole and jail. And I don't know why you're playing me this music, but then the happy go lucky part could be good. If I look at the other angle of it, that to the Norma Ed relationship, this is a win. Mm -hmm. And to Norma personally, I mean, you could argue it's more a win than a loss, although I think it's a bit more complicated than a pure win, but yeah. y- you could argue that it fits in a certain sense. I'm leaning just to say it's weird. It's 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 kind of in the middle for me. It feels a little off. I think that with any of the relationships, it might be a little bit more better between both Ed as well as Norma, especially with the recent events that they've had to face. So having almost in a musical way, giving a sense of potential promise, Mm. being like, this is a happy moment for them. I'll allow. The big thing I got to say with all of these music examples is that they are strange. They are ones in which are a little bit more riskier than I've seen in other points of the series. If if you say wonderful and strange in this, I'm going to draw more blood. It is strange and wonderful uh, Uh. (laughs) when you consider uh, just how unique this episode is with it. And I am at the very least, whether you take these are horrible or these Mm. are great, I'm glad that these choices were made at the end of the day. No matter what sounds you may hear during the recording of this podcast, no unplugged professors were harmed in the making of this episode. (laughs) But as this continues, that may change. (laughs) So speaking of setting the mood, candlelit dinner between Audrey and Bob. Oh, it, it was lovely, I gotta say. You got yourself like 2,000 candles in the Great Northern. If someone accidentally trips over one, I, it will probably all burn down. I love taking my dinner date to Yankee Candle. <laughs> I gotta say though, <laughs> uh, I didn't even notice that they were even like eating food. I think that they were just surrounded by candles? Or were they eating food? Uh, like, and they, I know they were having a conversation, mostly business conversation. Maybe it's the latest technology where the calories are taken in through your body through scent. Mm -hmm. So the candles are emitting nutrition Mm -hmm. and they're inhaling them instead of food. Uh, Right, right. Smoke-based nutrients. And with delicious smoke-based nutrients, we also have to note the owl in the room because there's a small little porcelain owl just staring at the camera. Bobby is um, just kind of fingering. He's kind of rubbing the, you know, his finger on the back of the owl's head. Is he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. He's kind of just massaging it. Okay. Don't word it like that. That's what he's doing though. He is touching the owl. He is touching the owl. Yeah. There we go. You feel better about it now? No. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but at the same time, when you word it like that and you look at <laughs> like, me like, no, <laughs> this is getting worse. The well, owl is there. Let's move forward. Well, well and I don't want to bring anything, you know, uh, sacrilegious into this because as they discuss, mm-hmm. this is a sacred relationship mm-hmm. because business relationships are sacred. Equaled only 
by the closest of personal relationships. Yes. Where nothing is held back. Mm -hmm. Reminded me a lot of the blood oaths that like Josie and Hank and I think Ben might have at one point, you know, took, right? Mm -hmm. The the, the blood oath idea. Mm -hmm. Um, That there's a sort of sacred pact that happens for business, for peoples in professional capacities, Mm -hmm. which in this case would imply that Anything weird we saw a couple episodes ago about the I like to lick ice cream stuff. You're looking at me like I'm the one making the weird innuendos, but literally Audrey a few episodes ago talking about ice cream in a very shady way, right? Listen, like it's it's not up to like it, it the show makes all its innuendos all at once. Yeah. Like that is the choice that it has. Dick Tremaine. Uh Dick but- Tremaine's not an innuendo. <laughs> he can be. <laughs> but <laughs> Whenever we start doing merch, right? <laughs> Dick Tremaine is not an innuendo is a good option there. All but right. this is a professional podcast. So, supposedly, yeah. Yeah, allegedly. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, yeah, Khalil, uh, tell me more about this blood oath, this blood pact that Audrey as well as Bobby are implied in. Well, I just, I think it's interesting because the show was flirting with a will they, won't they where Bobby and Audrey were seeing each other more often. We open up with this candlelit dinner. It feels like maybe there's some romantic moments here. But it does feel like, at least from Audrey's point of view, she's emphasizing the business element of it. Does it seem romantic? It's candlelit dinner. It, it, okay. Do you take we your, have not implied yet the dinner. That's the confusing imagine part. Imagine if you're like going to apply for a job, and the boss wants to take <laughs> you out to a candlelit dinner. We don't know it's dinner. The terms. A candlelit dinner. Candle. <laughs> a candle and sitting. If you were to walk into a job interview and that was the setting, uh-huh. would you not feel a little weirded out by the, the overwhelming romantic atmosphere? Uh, I don't know if it's romantic. I think that there is a dreamlike quality to it. But at the same time, I think that maybe the boss is a vampire, Finally too. Finally walked into a shrine. Is that better for you? <laughs> guess that would emphasize the I, sacred element. It, it, it gives more so of a very attentive feel like pay attention to this it is basically glowing literally with that thousands upon thousands well, of candles and you could argue that if we are taking the romantic side that there's a burning passionate flame is there like Times it seems many. like it, it seems very like a whimpering flame with them no, like I meant that, literally sh- in the terms of the candles like okay. there's many actual flames mm-hmm. uh yeah the actual in between is sketchy <laughs> at best uh we do know the heat is getting to at least one person though because audrey does share some thoughts on her father ben uh and she compares her father to an ice cube that is melting oh that's sad that is sad then again when is anything involving audrey's relationship with her father ever not sad <laughs> like that's kind of their entire relationship we've encountered right like yeah um it seems that I, d- I don't know how this is going to end for good old Ben. I really do yeah, not. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do, because I've seen the show, but uh, <laughs> I, won't, I won't digress anyway. I'm the one who does not know what shall happen, and that scares me. Yeah. I don't know. I guess, yeah, I, I, I feel like there's so much I want to say about the Blood Oath thing, but I'm just kind of left at an impasse where I just find it interesting that the biz- sacredness of business relationships would come up here in the show. And I feel like there's enough of it in the show between like Catherine and Josie and Hank and Ben that I'm just like, I want to say there's more to it, but I'm not there yet. I think I need to let these thoughts percolate a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and also some thoughts that need to percolate for Bobby, apparently, because he doesn't know what's there going was on. a fish in the percolator. I, I, I'll be a little honest. delayed on the response there. <laughs> I'll be honest. I had my finger on it. Then I decided I shouldn't, but I bumped it on my way back. Well, yeah, it's committed to it now. It's recorded <laughs> on audio, so we can't remove that. We never edit anything out of the podcast, right? Nothing. Wink, 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 wink. wink. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go on. This is recorded live. Whenever you're listening to this, this is live. If you pause it, we also pause in real life. Please help me. Clearly, this kept me trapped in this warehouse for so long. <laughs> Where have we been for two months outside of time? Um, but no, Bobby was asked by Audrey, you know, what about Shelly? And Bobby's like, what about Shelly? And I take it less as like a... Did Bobby turn into a turtle? <laughs> le- less of a romantic, like, mm, what about Shelly? And more like, a, I think he forgot she existed for like 10 minutes. I think that there is a front Bobby puts up enough just saying, what about Shelly? As if to make sure that uh, 
as far as Audrey goes, like show up up front being like, what about Shelly? If it, you could say that it is a little bit of flirty or maybe a sense of trying to assure this business relationship, it really is dependent on how you feel Bobby is handling everything in that moment. As far That's as fair. I go, I think that there is a little bit of that romance okay. he's trying to push there. But then again, I don't think Bobby's that good of a person yet. Yeah, or, or again, my gut wants to lead to the idea that Bobby is so completely unaware of his own actions that he genuinely didn't even, like, think about Shelly here. Yeah. And he's like, what about Shelly? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, I feel like there might be a delay in his thinking. I think any of those interpretations work, though. Yeah. No, it, it, it's a fascinating line. It's got layers. It's got layers. Just as many layers as the Johnson household seems oh. to have. Between the walls, the plastic screens... And all the jars of jam that have been shattered upon every surface. Yes, it is uh, not really a good place at the Johnson household. Yeah, we, we cut after the uh, What About Shelly line to Shelly uh, in the darkness mm -hmm. with a, a cut to Leo's like silhouette mm -hmm. with his back turned toward the camera. And he's got like an interesting like hunch stance going on mm -hmm. where like one shoulder is raised and the other one's kind of lower, kind of got like an Igor vibe, you know? Mm -hmm. Um I really enjoy that shot. How do you know it's forward instead of backward? Like, I have a hard time trying to distinguish that. Um, third eye. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's your third eye. Got it. And then the jar of jam, as for mentioned. Mm -hmm. As for mentioned, that's not a phrase. It's a for me. <laughs> Aforementioned? Uh, you know. Uh, as before mentioned. Uh, as... Caroline, Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, we got this ambiance going here. We got the wheelchair creaks. We got that music that may or may not uh, delight you. And Ooh, it, then, it delights me a lot. Notably, visually and audibly, mm -hmm. spiritually and physically. Absolutely. There is an owl hooting. Oh, oh I thought we were still talking about the chair. Yes, also the <laughs> owl hooting. <laughs> uh, what yes, you uh, think? No, it's not just hooting, but it's in like quick succession. What I think, like, because Leo starts like break out and starts acting very violent and in, very in the words eerie. of the Limp Biscuit song, he wants to break something if, tonight. If we want to assume that it is like the L's, I imagine this is either spirit similar uh, or perhaps, perhaps blatantly, perhaps, uh, what what is his name? Crazy Bob. Good old Bob or, or Mike. You, you keep Bob? adding the term crazy, Bob? but crazy. Bob. Yep, it is Crazy Bob. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is he sane Perfectly Bob? Perfectly within his rationality, Bob. Bob, yes. Uh, so you think Bob might be sitting on the perch? Bob there on the or tree? something like Bob because the way that it's just so quick, as far as my sight goes, it seems almost like cackling like we've seen Bob do before. Now, presumably, rationally, that owl isn't doing anything in this scene other than just being outside and hooting. However... The presence of the owls is important. We've yes. seen, like, the presence of the owls affect people if we are to remember our good old friend with the flower section in his home. Harold? Harold, yes. Yeah, the owls are not what they seem. The owls are not what they seem, and if they can just perch aside uh, while Leo has superpowers, I think that there might be something to say there. And one thing that isn't as it seems that we caught while doing our third rewatch of this episode <laughs> because of the process we've been doing. Yep. Uh, we see that uh, Shelly comes forward with, like, a knife, and she starts threatening Leo. Like, she is just ready. She is crazy. She's ready to stab, runs straight towards the wall, cuts away at the wall, and tries to find a way to escape and shout out for help. As Leo grabs her and flings her to the side, she drops the knife as it falls towards her and then flings away from her. Like, like gravity has defied itself and flung itself across from the wall. Yeah, she falls, and for a, a brief moment before the cut happens on the, on the screen, you can see the knife is maybe, like, two inches from her hand. It's falling towards her, like it yes. is leaning and going Currently towards moving toward her, like, two inches from her hand. Yes. Then it rapidly cuts to, woo, it just goes <laughs> flying away. So good. So, there is one of two things happening here. And one of them is going to be a Twin Peaks blasphemy to even suggest. The other one is just so crazy, it might also be nonsense. <laughs> Option number one is yes. it's a production error. <gasps> that Impossible! Possibly there was a little bit of a problem where the knife fell in between the cuts and it just doesn't line up very well. Khalil, I that want you to apologize. So it had been given more time, it might have, you know, improved that element. Khalil, right now, I want you to apologize to your audience I, right now I'm because everyone something... knows that everything in Twin Peaks is as it should be and everything leads up to the points exactly. Like, it is, perp it is, it is the way it should be. 
I'm going to do one better. I'm going to give you an alternative that will make you forget I even said the first You option. should. The owl used its magic to move the knife away from Shelly. Or Leo. Probably to move it away from Shelly if it's a malevolent spirit mm -hmm. on the side of Leo. Or it is also a, it could be an action of like, oh, Shelly, no, don't fall on the knife. We'll just push this aside. <laughs> it wasn't going to like... <laughs> Okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> That's dangerous, Shelly, no. Or the fourth option, the owl isn't good or bad. It just likes to swing <laughs> knives around. Whee! It's just, let's if do you this. were an owl that Fun. could swing knives around, would you not use that power at every chance you got? I feel like, you know that, that card game Super Fight? Yes. Where you like have the characters and the abilities? That's what I feel like that is. Like You're a screeching <laughs> owl, yes, with the ability to throw knives. Okay. Can move objects without touching them. Hmm. And I feel like we just drew that card right now. Perfect. It, that, perfect. And, and I, I guess, forgot like, to blast me completely. Bad editing or excellent magical lore aside. Yes. Uh, how was your immersion in this overall scene? Like, Did you feel invested? Did you feel it was real? Now... First time that we watched it, I was completely immersed, just like enjoying these bits and details and just having fun time. It's only through our second watching that we discovered the knife thing. And it was a, it, it, it just became more of a fascinating moment at that point. Just, just the way that we can have these mental options on whether or not this is even intentional. Um, I love mm -hmm. it. I love it. Uh, it, so I suppose it's the immersive way of whether or not I'm in on the scene or I'm in on the ride and having a good time. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, for me, I, I kept getting taken out of the scene. Okay. Um, The part where Shelly can't open her own door, it's like that stereotypical, like, horror movie problem where it's like, just open your door. Like, I understand you're panicking, but, like, come on. Mm -hmm. You can get out of your own door. <laughs> uh, and just some of the, the, the elements just feel a little bit hokey. Like... It feels very silly. Like after she stabs the leg and he's like stumbling Frankenstein like out of the out of the room. I get why he would, but I just keep thinking like this is weird, this is silly, this is whatever. Now Khalil, I will let you know that my favorite horror movies tend to be the ones that are more silly. One of my favorites Campy. is like uh Leprechaun, which literally is uh spoiler warning, you kill people off with uh pogo sticks and the like. So personally, uh I was in tune in the horror. I think it's a different kind of horror. It's not innately bad. Yeah. I just don't know if it was the kind of horror I was looking for. My favorite part of the scene again is that silhouette of him, you know, kind of having that unusual stance in the dark. Then she looks away, and then he go look she looks back and he's gone from there. Mm -hmm. I like that suspense and interest. Mm -hmm. I think the moments before this where like he was just acting ominous and occasionally like making no noises and stuff and like growls, mm -hmm. that was more suspenseful and genuinely unsettling than this was mm -hmm. because it was just so campy. I don't mm -hmm. know for me at least. Uh, what do you think Leo's emotions were in this scene? That is the fascinating part. And uh, is it okay if we talk about wife at this time? Goodbye, wife. Leo Johnson, award-winning line. He genuinely, uh, I mm -hmm. think that is a great line. Like, think about it this way: Leo Johnson is already. Uh, Horror, like like what well, we presume from the context we've get, been given, he's kind of a horrible person. Oh, he yeah. is very abusive. Uh, we haven't really seen Leo in a good light. He is someone who is really into his own personal aggression, and he is quick to act out on his anger. Now, yeah. we have Leo get caught in a medical situation where he cannot move or do anything. And all that anger, I imagine, and seeing how Bobby and Shelly are behaving around him, just imagine how much that can build up on someone like him. Someone who is filled with rage and suddenly is like a little bit of a soda pop and just shaking up and shaking up and shaking up. This is when Leo has eventually popped and he is his movements seem to be based off of that pure sense of like, I am angry to the point that I don't think that he is even in his right mind anymore. The fact that, like, he has addressed Shelly as Shelly before, but the way that he cannot really even hold on to his emotions and just simply say goodbye, wife, you could say in different things. It could be, one, mm -hmm. this is Leo just acknowledging you were just simply wife to me. That's you. I, you're, I'm not even going to acknowledge your name on this. You were right. just my wife. It could be a sense that he can't even, like, emotionally connect anymore, so that thing is absent. Wife died now. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Um, it is it, it is a choice of word that, that it 
I like and I can chew on better than I can if it was just Shelly, like Goodbye okay. Shelly. So I like Goodbye Wife, and that is the sort of feel that I get from Leo, this violent man who has only been and looking at things that would probably piss him off more and more and more at every step of the way. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah, good. Good. And then <laughs> it's the good he's pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> he has rights. Okay. He shouldn't. He should be in jail. Technically, she's been cheating on him. And technically, Leo should be in jail. And technically, yeah. So, instead of going to jail, Leo goes somewhere else at the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to get, you know, on a tangent about uh, a certain person that rhymes with Bindam Burl. Not yet. Mm -hmm. But he does go to Bindam Burl's babin mm -hmm. out in the woods. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do you think of that? Uh, someone emotionally broken, falling into the hands of someone who could be very manipulative. Um, I'm interested to seeing how he will utilize Leo likely as a tool, another pawn in his scheme. Fair enough. Uh, there was the owl ominously in the woods as well during that. Yeah. S sumptuously sacred. The owls? <laughs> what am I talking about? I don't know what you're talking about anymore, but the owls are following Leo, and that can say something. Um, just imagine, like... Are the owls following Leo, or are they urging him on? It could be one way or the other. Um, I can't or say for certain now. Or are they just making fun of him and, like, watching from the side, like, oh, look at this bloke here! Oh. What? I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. What were you doing? I don't know. <laughs> You know, that's a question. The question you just ask, what are you doing? That many people have asked the writers of Twin Peaks regarding the <laughs> James and Evelyn arc of the show. Mm. This much mel mel maligned? What? This much maligned element of the series. <laughs> much maligned. <laughs> maligned. It's much maligned element of the series. Uh, Professor, Caroline, you've Caroline. been enjoying. Yes. Uh, no, I have personally enjoyed it. Uh, like The number one fan of James and Evelyn the unplugged professor. Um, potentially, I don't know. What's the context? I don't know. Just uh, like no, I I enjoy the sort of wrench being thrown at James, in which he has. <laughs> want to throw a wrench at James? I mean, a lot of people want to throw a <laughs> wrench at James, but like, wow. No, it it, it is becomes a more of a conflict for him that he's kind of got to accept a few things of the outside world and himself while looking into this small microcosm of a story that we may not know the full details of. Mm. I personally like exploring those smaller stories and looking at these sort of characters. And in truth, uh, the conflict with James and Evelyn is more complex and more interesting than what I've seen with James and Donna, or at mm -hmm. the very least, how it's been utilized with James and Donna. Intriguing. So I, I suppose that I'm just more upset on... James and Donna and how they have been handled that I will accept anything else. <laughs> I, I guess it's a, it's a rebound situation here, isn't it? It, it is literally rebound for him too. Yeah, I mean, no, it, it is it fitting. It makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> uh, we do get, we do get more of a glimpse into that situation this episode into uh, the garage of Jeffrey Marsh. Uh, we have at first like this shelf with like pictures of cars accompanied by like, cool like little miniature cars and then it goes to a new panning shot of the actual cars in the car garage previously seen to have car related trophies you know i think that mr marsh has like interests like you know he, he, he likes he, to drive maybe what maybe oh i thought he just liked like you know the color of cars and the smell of cars see and i would say that and yet he does seem eager to test his car out in the open road oh he is like i love the look of this man. Like, when you see all these cars, when you yeah. think of, like, a trophy wife, when you're seeing this estate, mm -hmm. what do you think of a man with this much power and money? Clearly, I think of a man in, like, a little sports jacket and sports, like, pants, ready to go off maybe for a run, maybe for a jog. But he's also got that business side of him because he carries a briefcase always with I, him. I really enjoy, <laughs> you know, when you just narrow in on this guy's performance in the situation that he's only in the show for, like, one scene. Yeah. He's got to make the most of it. So he's just, like, having a good time talking about cars. He doesn't even, like, seem at all aware that Evelyn is just staring James down. Yep. Because, you know, uh, him and James have a similar interest. Yeah. Similar love. Cars. cars. It's so good. Good night, everybody. Roll the credits. <laughs> yeah. We're done here. It was great. Yeah, no, it is It is a fun encounter. Uh, what do you think he was going to do? Like, again, briefcase mixed with tracksuit. 
He was going to go buy a car. <laughs> <laughs> he needs more of them, clearly. The, clearly, he just carries a briefcase of mummy, money. Well, maybe he's bringing the brief ba- brief base back <laughs> from where see. he had... Brief base and mummies. From where he'd previously come from, right? He'd been out of town, so he had his belongings in the briefcase. Could be like a suitcase. <laughs> that was a tiny... For tiny clothes. <laughs> tiny clothes. It's, it's a tiny suit. It's like his his red jacket, like inflatable. He just pumps it up every day. Or maybe it's like a little bike pump and like an inflatable basketball. He's just ready to go oh, play a game with the friends. Yeah. Yeah, you know. But unfortunately, the, the we strange never... microcosm of the story of this man will never discover. Like I said, the right. strange story of this man. It's unfortunate <laughs> we'll never get to hear about that because, again, he went to test the car on the open road and this ominous music and a close up on Evelyn's face. Yes. And what I originally remembered faultily being a Wilhelm scream mm-hmm. turned out to just be like a. A cat? <laughs> no tires. <laughs> the other, the oh, other yes. one. Oh, yes, the other one. Uh, yeah, no, it was a strange moment where he, like, was combining multiple sounds, which kind of, like, it was the sound of, like, tires screeching and so on and a crash happening, but it was layered enough to seem like a scream. And, again, something I love about the sound on this. This is a juicy mm. sound episode. It is the juicy sound, uh, no doubt, of uh, Jeffrey Marsh being crushed and crumbled and bailed. Like, it is implied, like, through uh, her eyes, like, this is something that will come to pass. Mm. Um, it is very much, like, hamming it up in that respect but i like to think that he just drove slowly about 20 feet away and immediately <laughs> crashed and burned that would be funny that would be funny uh we get later the aftermath of that crash and it cuts to james give a little bit of that james fan service to all you james fans out there all you shirtless james fans. but not for long because he's putting on a shirt mm-hmm. with the radio playing a sport ball game in the background how do you know it's sport ball i remember them shouting a thing about a ball oh Okay. I think so. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, they could have been. It was a sport thing. What do you think of the radio thing. being in the background? That was an unusual choice, given uh, that we've not heard that before. <laughs> I think that it is fun for the moment, just like there is a sense of, uh, what would you call fanfare? For okay, the moment? so you took it as fanfare? Mm-hmm. Okay. See, I didn't really know what emotion it communicates. Like, for me, it wasn't really doing anything. It was just, like, noise. It was something that uh, was cheering on uh, just because that was the primary noise, the sound of the crowds going on. Is that the crowd celebrating Ah! James's James's torso? No, it is Without his shirt on? No, when a crowd is cheering, it is encouraging an action. It is something which they're saying, go, 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 or throw that ball in the hoop, or smack that ball over off there. Um, Smack that ball over off there. (laughs) Yes. The common thing. (laughs) You yell at a team during a sport. Clearly. And it is... And it's something which James is being egged on on. It takes something of James' interest and also having something in which, like, James is trying to be pulled either in the scenario or where he's going. I leave that up to you, the audience, on where that goes. But I do believe that there is a sense of something being pushed on James. And that's where his big old conflict in this life of sports ball he is playing in. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe we get some award-winning dialogue here, uh, which I'm just going to recite here. Go for very it. Very briefly. Please. You were good with Jeffrey. I didn't feel that good. I can change that. James pushes her away. It's wrong. Love isn't wrong, James. <laughs> We went through all sorts of, like, voices for different characters. I I didn't know if the narrator was still James, and he was just narrating his actions. And then suddenly Evelyn, like, stepped on her toe, and I love it. I love it. Okay, my my point is, love isn't wrong, James. God, what a line. I can't stand it. Love isn't wrong. Well, okay. There's a difference between, like, bad, bad, and, like, campy. And, like, cheesy. I like how you get to smack on the cheese there. (laughs) Yes, uh, I do agree. I I don't know which one each viewer is going to interpret it as. It's kind of up to them. But I think there is a potential appeal in these lines that it's not just, like, bad writing. It's it's soap opera camp. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, It's meant to be a little overdramatic and melodramatic. And that's what it's doing. And if it succeeded in that, it did a good job at what it was trying to do, whether you like it or not. Yes. I don't know if I like it. But okay. I do accept that it is accomplishing that goal of being the cheese. I don't know if I like it, but I accept its existence. <laughs> Sometimes that's what you got to do. Uh, well, I'm glad that you can step think, away from think your about it this for way. that. If in Dragon Ball Z, Frieza would have been able to have that attitude, <laughs> think of how much easier it would have been for everyone. <laughs> Very well. Um, 
<laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, at Wally's, someone enters, smoking, over dramatically pausing before they say things, emphasizing certain words very pronouncedly, wearing shades. Who could this individual be? Only one possible person. Please, please let let let's have, have it be something else. Can we pretend it's a different continuity here? There's only one person who loves James so much Does that she? she would go all the way a few miles west. Does she? <laughs> to it's not a few miles; it's a couple hours. A couple hours west. Yes, which is yes. practically the other end of the globe. Yep. To catch up to him, <laughs> and to steal him away from this older woman, this black widow, arguably, maybe. There's another Black Widow in the episode, so who knows? Which, by the way... Uh, it's Donna. It's it's Donna. That's the person I'm talking about. Her name's Donna. Since we are on the subject of travel, we do discover that this is like a sense of... Uh, yeah, I, I gotta go over it, okay? Um, no, that's fine. You're just being thorough at your job. I yeah, get it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, from what we understand, mm-hmm. Twin Peaks takes place... Closest thing that we can get to it is Squalkami. Snowqualmy. Snowqualmy. I'm sorry for anyone who s- stays in this place that I am horribly pronouncing this. This is the closest thing that we got to Twin Peaks, okay? And uh-huh. I kept thinking to myself, looking at a map, just like a couple hours. Away. If James keeps going, he's going to hit the ocean, which by... Well, at the very first, he'll hit a lake unless he goes start going south a little. Yes. He just goes directly no, west. No, no, no. No, it's, it's still be like the ocean. That's still the connection of the ocean. That's where, like, the little, like... Axis of the ocean, the, sort of uh, crux, the ocean axis, yeah. <laughs> crux the ocean into axis Washington. crook, yeah, yes. yeah. And as we'll later discover, that he's heading towards the ocean, Mexico. I think so. Yeah, well, tech- that was that wasn't true though. That's yeah, Evelyn's it, it's lie. not true. But no, you can't just use the lie <laughs> in your weird theories. Anyway, continue. But it's to my point that going out west, I imagine they would have hit the ocean in a couple hours. But no, apparently you kind of have to just go around the very crook of the. Mm-hmm. Um, ocean and there is at least four hours worth of travel yeah. about closer to about three and a half because between uh snow place and queets uh it would take let's see Stop. it'd be about three hours and 17 minutes so a couple hours that means he only has about an hour till he hits the ocean again and then sails his way into Mexico. Thank you. So for there, there is listening. opportunity, everyone, that James could head out west enough for a couple hours worth of travel without driving into the ocean oh, where uh, the Marsh Manor must be. Thank you for clarifying that for everyone wondering that question. <laughs> yeah, it was in my soul. You're welcome, one person <laughs> who lives welcome. in Belgium. It's... You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, Belgium fans. Hi, Hi, Belgium fans. We love you. We love, we love you all. We, we love, love you, all. you more than Donna loves James. Uh... Can't even out, 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 no, 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 that can be true. That oh, can okay, be true. Okay, okay, because okay. it's not love. It's it's something weird. It's something very unhealthy. <laughs> she, she shows up, back to what I was saying five years ago. She shows up in bad. <laughs> At Donna mode, looking for James at, at the Wally's. bar. At Wally's. Conveniently for the plot, Evelyn is at Wally's. At the same time, Donna shows up unplanned. Mm-hmm. Just happens to work out that way. Yes. And at that point, well, okay, maybe, hold on. Am I remembering it wrong? Maybe Evelyn's there to click the money that was being sent from James's account? I don't know. That doesn't even make sense, does it? No, she just appears at the bar whenever just, she needs to. It is to. just random. Okay, whatever. It, it's just random when she was there when James came around. It'll be just random when Donna comes around. But Twin Peaks can do nothing wrong, so obviously magic. Um, mm-hmm. So because of magical <laughs> reasons, yes. they were there at the same time. And I mean, if you think about it, maybe she just went to get a drink after she murdered her husband. I think that's and drink And Donna worthy. conveniently went at the same time. Yeah. And uh, they talk for a little bit, and uh, Donna says that she's looking for James. And, of course, there's only one possible James it could be. It's a very rare name mm-hmm. in the English language. If you're looking for a James and James has landed in your lap, clearly it must be that James. It must be James Hurley. So Evelyn guesses it's James Hurley. I mean, it's the only James that matters to her. Yeah, therefore, it's the only James that could possibly be living within a, like, you know, 200-mile radius. Because mm-hmm. we don't even know if he's still there anyway. I mean, um, James isn't a common name, right? That's, that's the joke I was making, yes. Like, how many James do, is, do exist? At least three. At least three. <laughs> and uh, we then get a moment where Evelyn asks Donna, are you what he's running away from? Again, more like dramatic soap opera dialogue. You can only hope. And it it, uh, it cuts away from this, uh, this, this scene with Evelyn and Donna to just you playing in the background. Yes. <laughs> and it goes from a watery-eyed Donna... Fading into a admittedly really nice silhouette shot of James like leaning on like this post 
And then he like slides down onto his like knees and then onto the ground, cradling his head as just you plays. Yep. That's the average reaction. Most twin peaks fans have when they hear just you playing, they start clutching their head in agony and fall to the ground. I mean, I will, when it comes to the prospect of a pot- potentially James and Donna getting back together, that he's missing Donna. I like to believe it's one of those like um, spoilers for star Wars, by the way. <laughs> unexpectedly you know how in the sequel trilogy there's like that force connection between ray and kylo ren where they can like visit each other in their thoughts sure okay i like to think that the just you song was donna transmitting a message to james like i'm near and i'm coming for you cool. and it's like he started to hear the just you and then he fell to his knees and sobbed khalil uh so far we've went through dragon ball and star wars what's the next space reference we're going to be making in this okay, podcast do you today? consider dragon ball primarily a space they go to different planets. A space anime? Yes. I don't know. I mean, like, but most of the time is still spent on, like, Earth. L- literally the... No! Yes, no, most you, of the time is on Earth. You go to Namek, and then eventually there's going to be the series where you go to the far planet of the gods. I mean, you spend a lot of and time then you go in to the, the afterlife, too. Does that mean <laughs> it's a spiritual god show? No. Yes. No, it doesn't. Yes. Ugh. But uh, I hope that we can continue this conversation in the future Dragon Ball-based podcast. That will never happen. Anyway... <laughs> James and Evelyn <laughs> at night. That was the next section we're going to talk about. That is the next section we're going to be Evelyn talking about. Evelyn catches I'm... James packing, about to leave. And Evelyn is like, no, don't leave, James. And James is like, it's wrong because you're married. And then she says, I love you, James. And she claims that she's never said that to anyone before. And her entire <laughs> life. Does she, she say that she doesn't say that to I love you or that I love you, James? Because maybe I this is the you, first. I love you, not I, I love you, James. I, I would hope that it's like, I love you, James. I've never said that to any James before. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was I, I love you. So that means that she's never said that to like a parent, a I'm, sibling, an extended family member. I mean, without no. Clo- element of family ever at any point did she ever tell them she loved them we can't assume that there is other family in the question she seems very close to her fake brother um she never told her fake brother she loved him as they were (laughs) in this passionate embrace so who knows maybe she might have been orphaned she might have grown up in orphanage we can't assume she had a family well she got married at no point during the courtship (laughs) <laughs> where they're exchanging I accept this love. marriage. Uh, I vow to be wife. Yeah, at the, at the wedding, it's like, I'll agree to whatever you say, but don't make me say I love it. And that's where Mr. Marsh says, hello, wife, right? And it's just like, <laughs> I, I understand the cheesiness of it, but it's just like, come on, Evelyn. It'd be different if this was like a high school romance drama and like the 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 high school boy or girl Ned never said they loved any you know they never said I love you to someone it'd still be weird because I'd still be in the back of my head going you have family probably right like a- some kind like a- as we are talking about this guys by the way uh I have paused I always have a specific portion of Twin Peaks paused and at this point it's just Evelyn looking sad <laughs> as Khalil <laughs> is pretty much like downplaying her emotions oh no you- as she gave this emotional reveal oh no professor do you hear that Wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. You mean oh, no. those sounds you're making specifically? Do, do you hear that? I'm not making those sounds. I'm covering my mouth so you can tell I'm not making them. <laughs> wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. That sounds muffled. Oh no. <laughs> That's how that? audio works. <laughs> uh, and it's the police. No, that's an ambulance. Wee woo, wee woo is the ambulance. Okay, what's the police noise? Wee woo. No, maybe that's an ambulance. That's like, that's Which like one you're calling pigs to eat. <laughs> No, that's Sweet. yeah. No, that's Sweet. no. We got to get the notes right. Uh, so uh, if anyone out there could email us <laughs> their sounds, file. an audio <laughs> file of pr- appropriate sounds for emergency vehicle, uh, vehicles, please email that to snakeeyedreams at gmail dot com or send it to us on Twitter at snakeeyedreams one, the numeral one, so that we may appropriately understand how these sounds work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Evelyn confesses there's been an accident. Jeffrey's dead. And James, to his credit. <laughs> Don't pause there. <laughs> to his credit, James figured out immediately that she killed him and that she had set him up. That's like the most brain activity I think James as a character has like ever put together. He's an ace detective, man. He is He is certainly one of those. Nothing gets past James. They don't call him James Death Note L. For no reason. <laughs> and, and and Evelyn was like, it was Malcolm's idea. He's not my brother. Oh, Goofy. Go, James. Go find the girl that loves you. And then James is like, okay. 
Man, I'm really glad that they cast Evelyn as like three different <laughs> actors at different positions. And it's seamless. I swear, it's seamless. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, so like a tearful Evelyn is telling him to go like two minutes after she was just like asking and demanding that he like doesn't leave. So it's just like the emotional whiplash, that which is weird because it's like, I guess maybe she counted on the police arriving later or like not figuring it out or what, because previously she was like, don't leave, James. Why do you have to go? Never leave. And then like the 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 noise happens, the noise that the listener is going to send us that is accurate happens. And then she's <laughs> like, you got to get out of here right now. Like, I'm not going to frame you anymore. I changed my mind on that. Just like go. You got a Donna to get to. And then he goes and he's got a Donna he gets to. He's got a Donna. He, he's he, got a Donna he did, and go. He did done get the Donna. <laughs> you know, I was I, I was ready to be upset, but I can't be upset now the way that you have worded it. Thank you, Khalil, for uh, giving me this temporary anesthetic uh, so that I do not have to face James and Donna until next time. I am sure that Doc Hayward has administered many temporary anesthetics in his approach to helping out Nadine. Mm-hmm. This is a transition. This is a transition, correct. It helps the transition. It, it, it's great whenever you... It helps the transition for you to state <laughs> how much of a transition this is. It makes it so much more seamless before. Well, you you be... have improved on your game since okay. we have went away for right. the ideas of right. transitioning. Middle school and high school, you know, kids writing their, their English papers, right? Writing they their, start their English their paper essays. writing and no, out saying this no. is an essay, right? My, my point is, <laughs> there's that problem. You know, you're doing transitions. You got to have them be smooth, but you don't want to have them be so smooth that they don't even work as transitions. You have to walk that fine line where it's like you're transitioning and like the reader knows you're doing a transition, but it's not like too obviously a transition. Khalil, your transitions are as if you tore the paper in half and then stapled the next <laughs> following piece together. But by all technicalities, it is a transition, but it is more of an art at this point. And I would say that that's an ample metaphor for the life of Nadine <laughs> at this point, that she is like a term paper that has been ripped in half and restapled together and turned into a work of art. That nice. is Nadine's psyche. Ed starts to tell Doc Hayward that Nadine is going to start dating boys. Why? Uh, because she has crushes in high school. She does. Um, and Doc Hayward, you know, asks the question you would ask when you are considering a 40-year-old or older woman going to date high school boys. The question you ask, is she sexually active? To which Ed responds that the next morning he feels like he's been hit by a truck. Which, by the way, I don't think that we covered it beforehand while we were talking about the music. but uh, And we'll likely be talking about it a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, th th there are three instances that we get in this show about people getting hit by trucks. Yeah. Hank set, makes the excuse that he got hit by a truck. Uh, when it came towards his parole, we have uh, Ed saying how he feels like he got hit by a truck. And I don't know what happened to Mr. Marsh, but it, I think that's some sort of car related issue uh, in which he had passed away from by assumption. How do you feel about uh, these car moments in Twin Peaks? Do you, too, feel like you've been hit by a truck uh, by them? Frankly, multiple uh, times. Frankly, I can't say that I car. What? It's care. But I just said it as car. Listeners, like I don't car. Listeners, help me, <laughs> help me. I don't car at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just a fun thing, but yes, please proceed. <laughs> uh, speaking of not so fun things, uh, Edward's concern that Nadine is going to start dating high school boys, uh, weirdly enough, seems to not be about like the fact that he's married to her or the ethics of the fact that she'd be sleeping with minors. Yeah. No, no. His concern is that she's going to hurt someone through her physical prowess. She will. She has. <laughs> and <laughs> and the concerning thing is that Doc Hayward also doesn't seem to be concerned about legality, morality, any of those sort of principles that a, you know, person should have when discussing the idea of someone sleeping with people they probably shouldn't be sleeping with. There's a power dynamic we should be more concerned about, but I don't yeah. see any concern. And uh, Doc Hayward just says, no, just tell Nadine to be home by 9 o'clock on school nights, and it'll be fine. Uh, so in case you're worried, Dr. Jacoby is the only one who is, like, giving questionable advice about things in the community. Uh, the medical doctor also seems to be giving very questionable advice in the community. 
Uh, we, how would you feel about, uh, like, we, there, there, I can imagine, like, scenes where someone tries to sneak out past nine to try to find their sweetheart. How would you feel if, like, in the middle of the night you see a giggling woman with an eye patch sneaking through the trees? If I saw a giggling woman? Uh, if oh. I saw a giggling woman, what would I do? <laughs> um, with an eye patch. With an eye patch, <laughs> singular. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. Um I I would probably skip the step that Hank took. I wouldn't I wouldn't challenge her. <laughs> I would go straight to the hospital myself. I would say, please admit me. I'm about to be hit by a truck. <laughs> Treat me before it happens. Sorry, actually that was wrong. It's a tree that fell on him. That's his story. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> you know, to which the reply was, "Honey, that tree was a redwood called Nadine." Because previously on Dragon Ball Z, Hank had been devastated by the Kamehameha. Of Nadine. Why? Why? <laughs> um, Why? The overlap of Twin Peaks and Dragon Ball Z fans has got to be more than one, right? Um, yeah. and, You're uh, the expert on this. This also happens after Hawk's report that uh, uh, he's booking uh, Hank for violating his parole... And Hank apparently claimed he was hit by a bus, which is why he wasn't at the uh, Jean Renault procedures yes. at Dead Dog Farm. Mm -hmm. A lot of cars. A lot of cars, a lot of trees. <laughs> Hank's not doing too great. He, he hasn't been doing great at all. Like, this, they, 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 at season one, he, he seemed fine. This brings me to a section I just titled in my notes, Elegy for Hank. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think at some point, I'm actually interested in maybe doing like a video on it, to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a podcast or a video, I don't know, but something more long form. Mm -hmm. I, I personally feel that Hank's character is among the most wasted potential in the series. And I know it isn't over yet. I don't want to tell the professor what's going to happen. But even just based on where we are in the show and Hank's trajectory, we left season one being like, ooh, Hank's kind of dangerous. Like if We don't know what's going on with this guy. He seems really interesting. And then ever since then, he's been beaten up by everyone new to town, everyone who's been to town before. <laughs> he's getting just everything beat out of him and he has no power no dynamic and unlike ben ben when he's powerless it's actually used in dramatic ways mm -hmm. whether you like or dislike the civil war angle it is something let's just face it even ernie niles was kind of more yeah. uh when you have complimentary when, when you have less agency than ernie niles in a story <laughs> that's what you're concerned uh yeah as far as when it comes to hank i think the domino is perfect because it's like that sense when you like put up dominoes when you're a kid and just put them in a row and you try to knock them over but then you realize what you were like a domino short or the angle was off yeah so like when you try to make all of them fall down it just again falls short you just we're off. So, it's like, yeah, oh, dang I, it. I like your attempt there to salvage his, <laughs> his domino usage because I would say the domino metaphor was a red herring. <laughs> I would say it set up this expectation that he's going to lead to a full domino collapse. Uh -huh. But instead, it's just a whimpering one domino fell. Maybe if, like, everyone that he was affected in life also had a domino to show that these are the people that will fall. Yeah. Uh, then maybe. But no, he's just got one domino. What's the use of a singular this, domino? just turn this to 13 reasons why, and I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> um, but, but, but really, though, I, I, again, I go back to that moment where it was Cooper and Truman coming back from the casino to save Audrey. And there's that moment where there's that man who's about to, like, kill him. And a, a knife goes whee, down the stairs from the mm -hmm. doorway. Mm -hmm. And we look back and who threw it? It was Hawk. Yep. They should have. I think what happened is that in the script, it said Hank, but they misread the N as a W. Mm -hmm. As far as... <laughs> Simple mistake happens. How would, like, we I already I, had the footage. They had to roll with it. I'm a big fan of Hank. Just imagine, like, he, when he throws this, like, big blade, like, through this man, mm -hmm. and he falls down, and, like, uh, he just runs down, and he's like, don't worry, I got you guys. And then suddenly, like, Hank has, like, something that he throws at Hawk. Right. <laughs> I don't know. It causes just... a domino effect. There oh! we go. <laughs> I just, I, again, sometime later, I'd like to do something long form for an elegy for Hank, because I just, I feel like he was such an interesting character at the end of season one and so squandered. And by this point, you know, he's looking like he might have to go back to jail and he's been in the hospital for being hit by Nadine. And it's just like, I don't know. the one thing I'm afraid of is that if this is just the last time we see Hank, like it's just like, Oh, sure. he's going back to jail. Do, do, yeah, do, and do. I can't say either way, but mm. 
I don't know. I, I, I can't wait with like this elegy that you proposed in the video that you want. I can't wait until Hank becomes very, very important these next few episodes. Yeah, and I'm just, it's a total red herring. Uh-huh. Uh. <laughs> uh, last section I have is called Ed's Feelings. I don't know how to segue to it, so I'm just going to say it's called Edward. Tell me more about Ed's Feelings. Um, so I'm sure you have a uh, like, paper that show that you are an mm, expert of this, mm-hmm, like Dr. Jacoby. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Tell me more mm-hmm. of his emotional state. Um, he seems pretty chill with James being uh, you know, out of town to clear his head. He's not really that worried about James. Again, I think it's still in high school. I think school's still happening. I think he's a truant. Um, but he's cool with it. Ed's cool with it. It's all fine. Ed's not worried about the mental health of, you know, his son effectively. You know, the the kid who just lost two people he loves very much in a short time period to murder. What's time in Twin Peaks? By, you know, Laura's father. He He's not worried about the psychology of this child. Just let him go. Just let him run around. It's all fine. Yeah. He, and, he'll be there to hug him lightly it, when he needs yeah, it. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And then, you know, he's just, he's just making the moves on Norma. You know, he's using his time while he can to focus on Norma as his, as his wife Nadine is sleeping with minors and, uh, you know, his son James is having psychological breakdowns and being framed from other states. Ed is putting his hands on, uh, he's putting his hands on Norma's hand. And Norma says, you know, people will find out. <laughs> and Ed, let him. Yeah, you, you, you mock his, like, first, like, line from the beginning, but I gotta say, I love the way he says, let him. Let him! Like, like there's a ferocity in mm-hmm. Ed's soul that I can get behind. Uh, not necessarily, like, some of his choices. Yeah. But I can get behind the emotion because it is so... It, it's a, such a good line read. It's so good. And, and we here at uh, at uh, Snake Eye Dreams Wonderful and Strange Twin Peaks Logcast, uh, we do not... Trademark. Stand by the actions of Benjamin Horn, uh, as he is a Confederate general in the Civil War. Yep. As far as the state of the war, we open up with this scene of his. We open up with his scene in this episode with the military anthems, flute, and marching drums in full swing as Benjamin Horn proudly surveys his battlefield. Audrey leads Jerry in, or should I say, General Jeb? Mm-hmm. And uh, we find out that he's marching on Washington. And this prompts, you know, Audrey's optimism. You know, we think he's getting close. Um, close to a victory for the South, which may in turn be a victory for his mind. It Maybe. What? Or make it worse. Why? I don't know. That's what Jacoby seems to think. J- Jacoby. I'll repeat. I really want to see Jacoby's papers. I want to see where he is allowed to practice. We will find things out about Jacoby at some point. I hope that is. I hope all we I explore can characters. Uh, well, I mean, that's all I could tell you. Okay. Um. Uh, uh, it's to the point where Benjamin Horn, you know, says in his, you know, kind of thick Southern accent, you know, only God can stop us now. And it is my firm belief, Jeb, that the Almighty is a Southerner. And then Jacoby from the back. All hall, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God! This like this the, everything happening with like this makes me nervous. Yeah. Like I how how is like the business even? I know that Catherine did get the business in the end. Yeah. But when like the main manager is shouting out about the Confederacy, singing great grand old songs as like people are visiting. Um. I how how is that? How I is the Great like, Northern doing hmm. with Ben's absence? I know how Audrey is somewhat feeling. We'll never see the rest of the Horn family yeah. other than Jerry again. Like, how is everything going in Ben's life when he is pretty much absent? In fact, does he even sleep? Does he sleep on the battlefield? Does he have a small tent in the corner that we never see? There are many questions that I have for his, like, treatment in his current condition and what goes on in Ben's life as we just accept this new reality for him. Professor, I don't really know how to respond to those questions. I don't know if anyone outside of God, (laughs) a known Southerner, could possibly respond. (laughs) But rest assured that Dr. Reverend Jacoby, he's not a reverend, he's not a reverend, he only has papers for being a doctor. (laughs) Dr. Jacoby (laughs) says this is healthy and by reversing the South's defeat during the Civil War, he will in turn reverse his own emotional setbacks. Professor, 
You don't have to understand why, but one out of one medical and psychological expert in Twin Peaks 100% agree that what Benjamin Horde needs right now is a, a sense of understanding and a Confederate victory. And it's this Confederate victory, right, uh. that brings us to the question of, like, how should we respond as a modern audience to this section? Because, okay, so there's, 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 there's two distinct camps here, right? There's uh-huh. the American listeners, and there's anyone else in the world who doesn't have to deal with America, <laughs> right? Bless your souls, right? Yes. Um, so for American listeners, the Confederate flag, the Confederacy isn't gone, like, it, it keeps popping up in recent years as a talking point. Yep. We can like to hope it's not going to happen as much, but there is definitely a sense in which there's outrage about when and where the flag should be shown. Same with, like, Confederate hero statues or Confederate villains, depending on what you want to say. We don't want to get political here too much, but there is a sense in which this frustration about where and when to show that part of history that was, you know, again, the Confederacy was founded upon the idea of, hey, we should be allowed to own human beings. Yeah. that's You can't get rid of that element from the Confederacy. That's why they did the Civil War. At this point, I'm just thinking, like, Jacoby's just around for a three-fifths compromise on Ben's psyche. Right, and how horrible is that, right? It is so, bad. So there's the problem of how problematic is this. If you're non-American... You may understand the Civil War Confederacy stuff, but it's not like probably as big of an issue where you live. I hope not, right? It's it's bad here because it's our problem that we mm. still haven't gotten over for 150 years. Yep. <laughs> so that's the question is like, whether you're international listener anywhere in the world or if you're an American listener, how do you approach this? Because mm-hmm. I could see someone really not liking how the Confederate angles played for laughs. Because mm-hmm. it is. It's ultimately, this is a joke. Mm-hmm. How are you not supposed to treat this as humor when we got Benjamin Horn saying, we few, and he like, turns on the fan so it can blow the flag behind him. This we is a very happy serious. few. This is a very serious situation. And then it goes into the look away Dixieland. Now, I'll be honest, I laughed, and I'm going to rat at the professor and say he laughed. <gasps> How dare you? The, the, the second I see a truck called Nadine, I am throwing you under that bus. <laughs> <laughs> is it a bus or a truck? It's whatever Nadine needs to be. Okay. Transformers, Nadine meets the eye. <laughs> There's one the eye. other space. What? Third space. We did, we did it, it, folks. We did it. And get it one eye because she has an eye patch, so yeah. it meets the eye, singular. They, you know, I love the fact that you know how humor works in which the joke has yes. to be explain stretched out yeah. and <laughs> hey you get it uh, you get it man okay but like yeah i don't know if there's an answer i don't know if, if professor you have an answer like the singular answer where do you draw the line between what's funny and what's like i'm glad this is in the show because it is good mm-hmm. and then what's like yeah they shouldn't have done this i think that as far as this line goes there's nothing that has <clears throat> It's, again, that strange tone of Twin Peaks. It's that strange mush feeling in Twin Peaks that I don't have an answer for that. I know that that might be disappointing, but the fact that this sort of pops up, this Confederate angle pops up, is neither surprising to me or, at the same time, is something in which seems off-putting, if it you It seems will. irreverent. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's in favor of anything. It's, it's showing it as Benjamin Horn's psychological breakdown. Benjamin Horn who's been a despicable human being for the show, mm-hmm. who not a man of good character, having a crazy mental breakdown, mm-hmm. right? If anything, this is almost more offensive to, like, mental health topics than it is anything else. Yes. I think it could be a serious case for that. Yes. Unlike Harold, who was actually portrayed, I think, with a sense of delicacy mm-hmm. and, and I would say appropriateness, I would say that Ben's current condition, it's treating mental illness as funny. Mm-hmm. So that also elements, adds an element of complication and problematic nature here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's clearly not saying, like, David Lynch or the show is supporting racism. Obviously not. Uh, At the same time, it's definitely using this opportunity as a quick way to add humor and absurdity by drawing upon a part of American history that uh, deeply scarred many, many, many people. Maybe you could say that it's adding that element into this flavored gumbo to add a sense of absurdity while also kind of I would say almost distracting from the idea mm-hmm. that it is a humored situation on someone's mental breakdown because, yeah, it, it tries to have that Twin Peaks sort of flavor, that sort of strange bit where there's dramatic mixed with humorous. Sure. 
but at the same time, like, imagine if it was being handled in a different way. Benjamin Horm has a clown fancy, and he brings out all the clown stuff, and he starts talking horns. A clown fancy? Yes, a clown fancy. Well, anyway. Like, it's it's a sense that I don't know. I, I, I find it almost as... Distracting as a red herring would be. Like mm. I don't I don't think that this angle is anything but trying to keep that balance up so it doesn't get to that extreme end of like, okay, this is just uncomfortable. Yeah. Um before the chance escapes me, I wanted to crack the the, the joke that the gumbo you like is gonna come back in style. <laughs> I you didn't give me the time to say it earlier, so we just had this awkward like two minutes of me holding this joke in. <laughs> And now I can say it, and now I can move on. Uh. It's tough because the, the basic idea here, at least in my interpretation, is that they wanted to give a physical representation of Benjamin Horn's psyche following his defeat at the hands of Catherine and his almost, like, destruction of being blamed for Laura Palmer's death. And they wanted to dramatize that in a way that could be portrayed in episodes and scenes as sort of something for us to witness. And the way they wanted to do that also would involve sort of a a humorous absurdity. And so to keep the tone light and absurd, but also reflect his mentality, they wanted to have an inner war with Benjamin Horn portrayed as an outer war. You know, have him dress up and have him start having these figurines and calling everyone funny names and Mm -hmm. ha ha ha, get Jacoby and we finally remembered he's in the show. (laughs) And, And, you know, it works. But the problem is if they're looking for wars, you know, arguably most wars... In the modern era... You're right. You know what? They should have put him in Nazi garb. Or that's it, right? That's the problem is who were you going to paint as the bad guys? Yeah. At least with the Confederates, they should be dead. Mm. <laughs> like, there is no Confederacy to offend, mm. theoretically. Mm. You th- you'd think. <laughs> you'd think, right? No one really believes in that anymore. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what... Because even, like... Going back to the beginning of the show, we haven't seen Johnny Horn in so long, but he wore that Native American headdress. Yeah. How uh, how good of an idea was that to have um, the mentally ill, uh, handicapped, whatever term, I don't mean to offend, but like to have someone with special needs wearing the Native American headdress? Yeah. What I, is that doing for either communities with mental health or Native American, indigenous peoples? Personally, I'm not an expert as far as that goes. I do not know how these attachments go. There's no real expert exploration of it other than simply it is almost like this child is a background piece at that point Mm -hmm. to try to explain away this again strange element through a more visual way but i don't like i could be wrong we we have some episodes left i don't imagine we'll be exploring any more horns other than ben at this point so well i mean audrey or jerry but you know the horn family that Mm -hmm. is gone now the mother and the brother rather than explore another horn Let's explore someone horny. Lana Milford. Uh, <laughs> the, the question is also whether or not it is exploring whether or not she is the horny one or everyone else simply is and That's she takes advantage of true. it. That's very true. But hey. You know, actually, you're right. This podcast, officially from this point on, regardless of whatever happens, because Professor doesn't know, we support Lana Milford unconditionally. Um, we are a podcast that, in the, in the internet term, we stand Lana Milford. Hey, uh, I'll be completely honest. Strong, independent woman. Is she? Uses her sexuality on her own terms. I mean, yeah, that's fine. I, I, I'm i fine with people using their sexuality on their own terms. It's just whether or not... Age is just a number. As long as both are consenting adults that are mm-hmm. well acknowledging the situation. Sure. But we have to... It, it's the camp on whether or not you believe that Lana Milford did not intend to murder her husband (laughs) amongst her persuasive sway, uh, or whether or not it was intention. In that case, this is the teeter-totter I stand upon. Well, thank goodness we have an expert with a prior success record with Benjamin Horn. Uh, We have Jacoby again. The magical Jacoby. This was even, like, scene by scene in which, like, Jacoby is able to, like, uh, handle himself, like, with talking about Benjamin Horn. And after, like, a small conversation with uh, our dear old friend Major Briggs, Hopefully some time has passed. These are back-to-back scenes. These are back-to-back scenes where Jacoby comes in. He has a new outfit. He has this fancy tie on when when he was rubbering the crotch of the hula girl talking about uh, Laura Palmer. Now he's talking about... yep. Yep. Is now using that same tie to talk about the sexual nature of good old uh, Lana Milford. at least Lana's not in high school. Quick question. I don't know how old she is, but she's not in high school. Like, she is Lana Milford, right? Right? That's the name. 
Yes, because she was married to Dwayne Milford, right? Yeah, Dougie. Dougie. Dwayne is the brother who's the mayor. Both have names that are too close. Okay, remember that Dougie, we dug a hole for him to lie in. <laughs> He's dead now. He's dead now. Yes, Dougie, the dead man. Yes. Uh, yeah, I technically by state, she would still be a Milford uh, if she yes. so chooses. She took it's on the so name. strange to consider, like, it was one night... You can take on the last name of marriage. And yeah. the marriage was beautiful, and it lasted one night. <laughs> now, Jacoby, again, is on the case. So if you were ever worried about anything, we have him on the roll here. Oh, he is definitely he, he on the case. He has spent almost 24 hours, almost 24 hours with her. He has had no bruises. <laughs> she was hiding in the closet during the Ben Horn situation. No broken... Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> no broken bones. And, uh, you know, so Jacoby says that any claims by the deceased brother that she is cursed... You could dismiss those. Jacoby is a known curse disprover. I want a spinoff of, like, you know, Mythbusters, but I want it to be Curse Busters. That just stars <laughs> Jacoby and Doc Hayward. <laughs> well, actually, hmm, I don't know who would have been good for that. And I guess... <laughs> Cooper? Okay, anyway, Why continue, not? continue, continue, continue. But I gotta say, like, they talk more about the sexual nature, and there's this eye that she kind of gives Cooper as everyone else, like, male in the room reacts. Uh, I believe that we have the episode of being Black Widow. She is uh, described um, as a potential Black Widow in mm. more ways mm -hmm. than one. I love her dress in this because it's like if this... It, you could call it a dress. It is a, like, zip-up style dress that kind of is, like, almost like a onesie, but yeah. it kind of has that design where there's a black and white theme, but the black kind of uh, goes from her bosom to, like, the, her mid-back. Very similar to very, I would imagine, like, um, suggestive and desire-based designs on, like, larger characters. Like, um, I would say, like, I think that her name is, like, eh. Can't remember her name. I'm thinking, like, spider queen individuals that I can I mean, see it, with the same design. It's like, it's like a little black dress, but made into a onesie. It's, it's yeah. a strange outfit. It is a strange outfit that is both, like, subtle, but at the same time suggestive, which I think is perfect for her character. I mm -hmm. think that the costume design on this end was nice. Well, it's the right outfit to go bowling in. Oh, perfect, because, because they are... she and Jacoby are about to go bowling. The 24 hours was mm -hmm. not enough. It was not uh, enough in there. It's getting hot in here. They have to cool off with some... Grabbing of the balls. Well, that knockout <laughs> performance aside, uh, we, we go out of the door there about, you know, maybe like 10 seconds later, we hear a scream. Yeah. Oh, no, that wasn't the no, scream. No, the scream was, ah! Yes, yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dwayne did not scream, but he was ready to scream as this man with, like, ready shoulders is holding on a gun. two-barreled shotgun. Two-barreled shotgun. He is just All ready. All brush you did to kingdom come. And the hippie too. Which, uh, by the way, uh, we are in a very intense moment at this time. He has mm. a gun mm. s straight at a woman, and uh, this is a tense scene. But in the background, can I make a joke? What? Can I make a joke? Yeah, go for it. If uh, if Dwayne Milford would have brought that gun to his brother's wedding, his brother would have had a shotgun wedding. I'm shutting down this joke right his now. His brother would have had a shotgun wedding. Get it? Because no. No, I don't get it, Cleo. I don't get it. Please, don't describe it, because I will never get this joke. I refuse it. <laughs> Fine. Okay, well, maybe you'll appeal more to Dwayne Milford's sense of humor, because he says that the claim that she killed no one is horse dung. <laughs> Yeah, that no, joke you laugh at. I you, laugh. You joke at poop jokes, I Professor. <laughs> How immature. I enjoy the vernacular on this man who decided that bringing a gun into a police station to shoot down a woman in cold blood, clearly with plenty of witnesses, was the best plan. So, yes, I do I mean, enjoy Dwayne He's not Glenn trying Dunn. to get away. He's just trying to get her away from life. Yes. It doesn't matter how. Per perfect way to describe it. And yeah. I also enjoy that during this tense scene, we also see a lovely poster that says, Mom and Dad, I use drugs. Yeah, um, that's not the professor confessing. Um, that's that's on the wall. That's just it's a very strange piece of memorabilia. <laughs> yes, I I love the background items in this, but right next to Andy's head. Right next to Andy's head. Cooper, as though like sensing the moment, right? Cooper senses the tension of a man, possibly unstable, emotionally a wreck, with a two-barreled shotgun and a, and a defenseless woman. Uh, Cooper does the rational uh, official police FBI business idea of saying, uh, Dwayne. You can always shoot later. Talk first. So he has the man with the two-barreled shotgun go in the room. With the two-barreled shotgun. With the two-barreled shotgun and the woman with no way of looking in on said room. 
just those two on their own. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone else who could possibly stop him from hurting her is on the outside of the room. Just lets them pass by. And then Cooper is just like looking at the camera and he will not add it, but like directly in front of it toward yep. it. He, he stands up. So he is in the foreground while everyone else waiting is in the background um, at the ready, just yeah. listening in on what is happening. And he, you know, Cooper says that uh, they just, just got to wait. Just got to wait. So the screen fades to black, right? It goes to a commercial mm -hmm. and then the commercial in, would happen if it was really airing on TV. Yes. If you're watching this on Netflix or Blu-ray. It just goes just black for black. a moment, and then it comes back, and they're, like, in almost the exact same positions. You have Jacoby kind of in the background, like, laughing and just a giggle, a little giggle in the background. Yeah, I love it. It's just, like, snickering, and, like, there was just this fun commercial that was in the background. It's It feels very fourth wall breaking. Like, this this is clearly, they were waiting through the ad break. Like, that, that happened, right? Like, mm -hmm. time is weird in Twin Peaks. We got Jacoby teleporting within <laughs> scenes, right? But that ad break was real time, right? Uh, I imagine. Uh, again, time is weird in Twin Peaks. 24 hours, Lon Milford. We'll never know. Well, but they bust in. No, no, no. Before that, they don't they bust get ready in. to they, bust in. They get so ready everyone to bust draws in. guns except Jacoby, who just kind of, like, flaps his jacket. <laughs> It's just as beautiful. Powerful. Just it is, as powerful. If not more. If not more. And <laughs> what do they walk in on um, when they bust in weapons and jacket ready? Dwayne is coated in kisses. I got lipstick lathered all over. I, I like coated with kisses more well, personally. Well, alliteration. I'm just going for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. Mine was better. Smothered by smooches? Oh, okay. No, that's good. I, I will secede. You are given the crown of alliteration hey, for now, but I will expect to get it back. I'm going to have it permanently <laughs> bolted into my head. You'll never get the crown off my skull. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he confesses that they have decided to adopt a child. Uh, uh, you know, uh, no swinging decisions here, which... Again, is where the Black Widow remark, as well as just how she may be, makes me nervous. I, I've said this before, like, she is she is very much akin to Laura Palmer if we took more of a jokey approach to it. She has men at a string of allure that seems to be following onto her. And whether she is malicious with it or not, mm -hmm. we have yet to be seen. Just... She has an effect on men. I'm very curious, Professor, when we get to the Secret Diary of Laura Palmer and we get to Fire Walk With Me, because that's Laura, right? Those are back-to-back -back Laura Those things. Those are back-to-back -back Laura. I am very curious, and I would imagine you're very excited to encounter those because you've only had so much to work off of for Laura. Yeah. So I am curious what your thoughts are going to be, how they'll stay the same, how they'll change, because Laura is a character that a lot of people read into in vastly different ways. Okay. And and I think your interpretation, some will like be like preach, and some people are going to listen the way you're describing Laura and be like, ooh, <laughs> I don't see Laura that way at all. <laughs> so I will have the unifying opinion. I will bring everyone together so that they truly know Laura Palmer intimately. Uh, mm. <laughs> oh no, uh, the sounds are beginning. Uh, I'm already going away from it. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and Lana says the totally innocent, not weird thing at all that uh, Dwayne so much reminds her of her dead husband. Yeah. And she says, you know, well, actually, no, he says that he's been lonely. You know, Dwayne confesses he's been lonely. He hopes that they will all forgive his boorish behavior. Yeah, he's bringing and, a gun into a police officer's area and just like being ready to shoot a person. Yeah, boorish. And then Dwayne's like, come along, my dear. And then they leave. And I don't know if the bowling is canceled. Uh, it's not said. Is, like, is Dwayne going with them to bowl? Is it going to be a threesome with it, the bowling? With may, the bowling! With the bowling! <laughs> it may very well be, uh, clearly. Uh, I think that my favorite part about this scene, though, is that Dwayne just leaves his gun. He yeah. he went in with a gun. He walked out with a Milford. With a girl. Mm -hmm. Gun for a girl. Mm -hmm. What a, what an exchange. It is quite the exchange. Which one's more deadly? Seen. Uh, clearly, uh, okay, so we what? haven't seen anything on screen with that gun killing anyone. That's true. But we in have the, seen the a woman. Twin Peaks guns maybe don't kill people, like, <laughs> actually, at Twin Peaks. No, no, we have people get shot by them, but Not this gun killed. specifically. Oh, uh, no, remember, uh, John Renault, he got shot down I and killed. Mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Died he died from the blood loss, not the gun. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, yes, uh, as far as the... Black Widow goes, she has the higher kill rate, uh, and the gun is left behind. Don't know what they're going to do about that, whether that's going to be confiscated or hmm. if they're going to send it back with a bow. Well, 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 we may never know. Perhaps Andy or Lucy will get their hands on it. Or Dick. Or Dick. 
or Little Nicky. Oh, Little Nicky's got a gun. So we get the scene, opens up. Andy wearing a latex glove or something akin to a latex glove. He is struggling, as many of us have often struggled, mm -hmm. to remove that glove. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're wearing the latex glove and your hand gets all sweaty, and then, you know, you're trying to take the hand the glove off, you know, and it's mm -hmm. not coming off. And, and as often it happens with everyday people, when you take the glove off, it goes flying and then sticks to a window across the room. Yep, it is completely stuck in which he has to peel away and has a fun, awkward conversation with Lucy. Uh, which, by the way, not only is debris left on her window, that can be rude and probably is setting a tone I mean, already. if you're allergic to latex, that also could be a health concern. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how, like, the residue of the latex would affect someone with an allergy, but... Yeah, uh, but regardless, messing up the window, not really good first impressions for someone who keeps her desk orderly and clean. I mean, she has potentially a pencil and a pencil sharpener or a pencil holder right at the center. So we know that yeah. she is very cleanly from this scene alone. Yes. And we also know another thing about Lucy is that she is not buying uh, Andy and Dick's conspiracy corner, right? Uh, what do you talk about conspiracy? You mean the complete facts? Of little Nikki. Yes. That uh, little Nikki, as Andy and Dick believe, uh, <laughs> killed his parents um just going to fall back uh, as far as this goes. Again, another fourth wall breaking moment. The one uh, thing that we have listed for Lil Nicky uh, on our notes of discussion is that he's nine years old. So I'm going to stick with that's the only thing we know of Lil Nicky. He well, is just a nine-year-old boy. And when Lucy exclaims, you know, he's nine years old. And he's like, I know. We think he was six years old at the time. <laughs> a murder. It's like, oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Yep. Lil Nicky will be the final boss of the series, clearly. Yeah, and it's it's like one thing, like, there have been tragic situations where a kid, you know, accidentally does get their hands on a gun and, like, shoots someone. And it, it has happened. That's horrible and tragic. Yes. But with the way that Andy and Dick are imagining it is that he is the spawn of Satan and that he purposefully, malevolently killed his parents and also anyone else that gets too close. Was it the scene uh, in a prior episode where Lil Nicky was literally in yeah, Lil Devil's literally outfit the devil, and yeah. in Burning Ground? Because I thought that it was just like, just, you know, uh, he, he just likes to go out for Halloween. Maybe. In hell. And speaking of Halloween in hell, um, we get Doc Hayward uh, bringing in Andy and Dick into a side room. Okay. And like a stern father who is seeing their child eat all of their sugary candy from Halloween in one night, in one go, you know, advising the children that of the error of their ways. Which, by the way, when they were entering the... Uh place when like dick was kind of entering in he both like opened up the door but also was smacked into the door almost like shoved into <laughs> yeah. the police station to set the tone you know yeah point is the doc hayward throughout the scene is acting like their father mm -hmm. like you know in a strange sort of commanding sort of way andy in uh, here oh, no, no, was it lucy that called for andy or was that doc hayward doc hayward said in here andy we're going to talk like very stern yeah. serious yeah and just like he's looking around the corner just like we also found Sad. out the deep lore that Doc Hayward had delivered Dick Tremaine as a baby. Yeah. And don't make me regret. But did not drop him on the head. And don't make me regret that. Yes. And uh, Doc Hayward reveals that he cut the red tape at the orphanage. He learned the secrets that Nikki is no murderer. And he goes through telling the story of kind of what the orphanage's account is of little Nikki's life. And as he's doing this from time to time, you'll have Andy or Dick try to interrupt. And whenever they try to interrupt him, he interrupts them back and tells them to shut up. Basically, just keeps putting him back in their place. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to rehash the entire Little Nicky story, because if you're listening, you've almost certainly seen this episode. Yes. Um, but th th the way it's worded here is, is so sympathetic toward Little Nicky that it's just kind of funny. Like, obviously, you'd want to be sympathetic toward an orphan mm -hmm. whose parents died tragically. Mm -hmm. But the phrasing of it, you know, Nicky entered life through the back door where there is no light. <laughs> His mother's an immigrant chambermaid. Um, the poor wretch never saw the boy. Which, by the way, when you're, like, putting forward a sympathetic story, poor wretch is such, like, a harsh word. Yeah. That, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And then what do you make of that fly at the end that Lucy swats? Yeah, uh, well, first, like, Lucy is, like, twiddling with a fly swatter, so she yeah. was already at the ready in case, like, that came through. But the fact that uh, this was a juicy fly. The word, oh, it's a gusher. It is. It blew up. I, do, do flies bleed red? Uh, if they've been... Consuming blood? blood? Yeah. I mean, you know. I guess it goes back to the log, the log, log lady's question. Mm -hmm. You know, does does blood pump from the heart of love of the universe? Well, clearly that fly had a that lot of love. That fly was the universe. It was it the universe. It was love itself. Uh, but, you no, know, it blew up. I believe that it is just to imply a 
probably a darker turn that we're going to be seeing by the end of the little Nikki arc. Uh, okay. I, I don't believe that little Nikki is completely innocent, that we are going to be, like, just ending on that light of a note. Uh, his name is Lil Nicky. He grows up to be Adam Sandler in a movie that about the devil. Canonically speaking, this is true. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could also interpret it as, like, the buzzing, pesky fly is, like, Andy and Dick, and she's, like, laying down the law where it's, like, swatting them down, their stupid ideas. And then it's they blow like up in blood. Aggression. They blow or, up in love. Or this is a prequel to the Terry Gilliam film Brazil, which opens up with a fly and the aftermath of the fly. The great like metaverse of like how movies are connecting with L- Little Nicky in Brazil uh, yeah. in this grand timeline. By yes. the way, Brazil, real good movie. Little Nicky, no clue. I just saw the I ending. Know, it's Adam Sandler, go watch Uncut Gems or something. Like what do you <laughs> or or uh, Punch Drunk Love? That's pretty good. There we go. I'm not I'm not a big fan of Adam Sandler's comedy. I think I've only like really seen one movie I like with him, and that was like Wedding Singer. He's he is really good in in some dramatic roles. Like he can handle if you give him the right script. He does mm-hmm. a good job. Mm-hmm. He really does. Now, let's go back towards the uh, miniature version of Adam Sandler, Lil Nicky. Now, I, I don't know if I got much more to say on him. Mm-hmm. That's the end of my I don't know if I got much more to say on Lil Do you have <laughs> okay. any more to say about Lil Nicky? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Major Briggs. Major Briggs. I got things to say about him a little bit. Okay. So, he suddenly appears, uh, one-upping Dick Tremaine's kind of weird stumbling in. Uh, Major Briggs, full-on stumbling in, passes out after asking to speak to the sheriff. I don't even know if he asked. I think he said he needed to speak to the sheriff. I don't remember his tone. Do you remember if he asked or demanded? Uh, I don't remember because I was too distracted by Lucy's reaction of looking down, checking her makeup, and then thereafter, everyone gets a drink of water all together. Inexplicably. We we need to stay hydrated. We don't know for sure the reason, though. We need to stay hydrated. Clearly, he fell on the floor, not because he likes the floor, but he needed water. Hey, us here... At Snake Eye Dreams, Wonderful and Strange, Twin Peaks Logcast, endorse the message of stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. Drink your water. Don't be like Major Briggs. Even if you have to acquire that water by immoral or illegal means. No. Stay no, hydrated. No. <laughs> this could this could <laughs> easily get uh, as someone who's going to hold on to the lawyer position of Snake Eye Dreams end, do not do it for illegal or immoral means. Just 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 find the tap. Yeah. Find hashtag find the tap. <laughs> and Briggs is trying to tap into the morality and hidden agendas of the United States government. Circa 1991, regarding Project Blue Book, regarding the White Lodge. He takes uh, the Pledge of Allegiance quite fiercely. He pledges that allegiance. To the flag of the United States I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. And to the republic for which it stands. What does it stand for, though? One nation. That's mis- <laughs> indivisible That's nature, Briggs. with liberty and justice for all. I forgot the part where it says uh, under one owl. But, uh, <laughs> no, okay. under one owl was added in the 1950s, oh, remember? Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> That's in the secret history of Twin Peaks. I forgot that part there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Briggs, he, uh, he confides in, the, in Truman and in, uh, in Cooper because he knows that they are men who have also dedicated their lives in service to their country. Yes. Uh, he, he says that, you know, they would know how sacred he holds the Pledge of Allegiance and the cost one must pay in breaking a pledge. Mm -hmm. But Briggs has to admit that uh, while he used to think that the Air Force was a force dedicated for the fight of good, he has some worries right Mm -hmm. now, to be frank. He he noticed that when he came back from his weird travels, whatever happened there, where he thinks he might have been to the White Lodge, something might have happened, Mm -hmm. the officials who were questioning him had shown degrees of suspicion that Briggs feels border on paranoia. Mm -hmm. And he must admit at this time that their motivation for searching for the White Lodge is not ideologically pure. He believes that during his disappearance, he had been taken to the White Lodge, is the clear intuitive sense that something is going wrong, that there is much trouble ahead, Mm -hmm. although he is not aware of the form it will take. Yes. So... Two things, I guess, to spin off here. One is what this suggests about Briggs and the show's overall attitude toward the United States government. Okay. And then the second thing is what we think is going on for the show's narrative with Briggs feeling that's going to be trouble ahead. He's not sure what form it'll take. Yeah. So let's tackle the first part here. What do you make of Briggs and his moral quandaries with the government? Versus kind of also how the show maybe was taking sides with this as well. I think that Briggs is coming to terms that 
there is this is a project that has been quote unquote closed if you will and he's running it in the background i think that he is coming to terms that things have definitely changed especially with the people that he may have known inside the service and that has caused conflict with Mm -hmm. him in fact there is a line that we can cover later if you'd like uh that i enjoy uh i will be in the shadows that can take up multiple terms. Like, say, for example, this conflict, this frustration with him, if we are to consider Briggs went off to this place of purity, the White Lodge, and we are to consider the Black Lodge to kind of, like, reassess things, Mm -hmm. maybe at this point Briggs is feeling that sense of conflict, and so Mm -hmm. he must revisit the Black Lodge in a way Mm -hmm. to try to come to terms with these new troubling things he didn't think would trouble him. Sure. So... Um, I find that fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, the government, however, there hasn't been much action. I have seen I mean, we've directly seen corruption within the DEA and FBI regarding the Cooper investigation. We have. There is a sense of corruption there, but that's a different branch. That's, yes. that's entirely different. But I don't think Twin Peaks has ever been shy so far about portraying people in high up forms of government in questionable ways as not really to be trusted Mm -hmm. that there is a sort of shadiness of it. Um, Cooper, we don't know how common Coopers are in the FBI. I mean, we, to be fair again, I'm not fully acknowledging there's a purity with Cooper fully. Like there's a passion with Cooper. I will give you that. There's that, there's that one recording where he's talking to Diane in his tape recorder and he like asks, he genuinely wants to know, what happened? Was it during the JFK assassination? I think it was the JFK assassination. I believe so. There, he, he like speculates about those things, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a sense that even Cooper, I think, questions the official narrative, what's on the books. Yes. Um, so I, I think it's interesting that, that Major Briggs here does offer this sense of, I used to believe that the American government and the Air Force took their pledges seriously and that they stood for something. And now he's doubting that the powers that be in charge of the country, essentially, mm. can be trusted. Mm -hmm. Um, which for someone like Briggs, such an authoritative, not authoritarian, but authoritative sort of um, loyal person Mm -hmm. who who takes those oaths and pledges so seriously. I think think the overall kernel of what I'm trying to get to is that Major Briggs takes the oath seriously, not because he has a blind loyalty that he is giving the oath to that group, Mm -hmm. but I think that he values the oath itself and the values more than who is involved in the oath. Yes. In the sense that, he will, you know, strive to work for freedom and for the public welfare, mm-hmm. even if the American government doesn't. Yes, uh, I feel that there is going to be a sense of opposition we might see in Briggs, in mm-hmm. which he will uphold to uh, a pledge more than a group. And that might come into actions he might do to help out Cooper in the future. We'll see when he exits, exits the shadows on that but hey uh he's going through his own emotional journeys i wish the best for him and his little aviator hat and pete is also going through his own emotional journeys pete martell famously decrying hot dogs which by the way there's we like forgot the hot dogs i love that there's we like we forgot the weenies <laughs> I... with the beef with the skin on them yeah as opposed to the skinless hot dogs uh but i just love that there's Those like the a... diet hot dogs yes i love that there's just like a pack of onions and a pack of potatoes on the counter but he hasn't doesn't have his hot dogs he can't make his fantastic mashed potato weenie onion mix <laughs> that we all were hoping for uh, we do get some new information and some old information where Pete is almost our audience surrogate here, uh, receiving a, a chunk of exposition from Catherine and Andrew Packard, emerging victoriously from the music room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, you, to, to gas, Packard is alive. Bum, bum, bum. And Thomas Eckert. Thomas? Thomas. Thomas <laughs> Eckert. We speak good in podcasts. Had been the one to stage the accident accident i said it in such a way that the quotation marks are visible to the listener's ears mm. that there had been a backstory here that eckert and peckard had been business business part business <laughs> i did their names right that's in business no. the character from steven universe business okay, had been their partner fourth space no we're going too far uh, business is a boring character anyway oh 
Okay, you don't even want to refute me. Bismuth is like a C tier Steven Universe character, and you know it to uh, be true. I'm fascinated by Bismuth and what it meant with Bismuth. Bismuth had one good episode at the beginning when they were introduced, and we're moving on because that's off topic. <laughs> so they have been business partners. Andrew Packard, New Lumber, Eckert, New Hong Kong, and they made a lot of moolah together. They had some fun times. But when Packard got the better of him in business, one time. Eckert tried to stab him in the back. Planned Anders' death for six years. Did you say Anders least. or Andrew? Yeah, Andrew. Anders. 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 Anders the Mint. Now, this is all according to <laughs> Andrew, right? So, like, Andrew's argument then to Pete and to Catherine is that Eckert got jealous and stabbed him in the back. And, or as I put in my notes, tried to stab him in the bag. I don't know why I put bag in there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't just sort of speak good. I write good, too. Um, but again, I think the question is, do we, do we have any reason to trust Andrew Packard? Like, no. for all we know, Thomas Eckert. He just Eckert, popped in. For all we know, Thomas Eckert has equally justifiable, if not more justifiable reasons for this. We know that, it, like, both, like, well, we at I least mean, know that Catherine is playing some sort of like yeah. 3D chess, 4D I mean, chess genuinely here. Admit, genuinely don't try to blow people up in boating accidents. Like, mm -hmm. I, it'd be pretty hard to convince me that was the right call. Yeah. Generally, like, murder is not the right call. I'm impressed on all the years that is going directly into the singular plan that yeah. I wonder like what they do with the rest of their lives. Especially like where, where does Andrew Packard really stay and do they just give him like the meat like the, the potato, onion, <laughs> uh, hot dog mix and slide it under the door for Maybe, him? Maybe, you know, Pete's been marveling for, for a couple of years now how Catherine suddenly started eating double the amount of food <laughs> but not gaining any weight. It's really strange how that worked out, huh? I also enjoy the fact that uh, there is a point with, uh, again, Catherine we've seen, like, make out with uh, good old Ben, especially in his current state, and potentially be manipulating that on the side and also having a new rekindled relationship with Pete. There's this interesting way that she touches Andrew's face that... Um, we here at Snake Eye Dreams uh, like to <laughs> analyze a anime called uh, Revolutionary Girl Ultimate <laughs> and its director, uh, Kunihiko Ikahara. And uh, this, for those in the know, we would call the Ikahara approach to sibling relationships. <laughs> It is it's very... It's called advanced closeness. It's advanced closeness as she rubs his face. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but, more important than that, they have worked out a way to lure out Thomas Eckert. They're going to use Josie, because Josie will draw him out like a rat to cheese. Yep. Uh, yeah, sure. Josie is the cheese. Josie is... Yes, yes, yes. What kind of cheese do you think Josie is? Uh, she, clearly, uh, she is a form of. I'm thinking of cheese names because I don't think of. This I usually. think she's a Munster. What's what is a Munster? Munster is a type of cheese. What what do you use it on? I don't know. I don't really eat it very much. I don't think it's that. <laughs> okay, Munster fans, I apologize, oh, I, but I don't think it's very good. I agree. It is a cheese that no one can describe. I think that is a great way well, to say for Josie. That, I think you've won this comparison. I think that Josie might be a Munster because Munster reminds me of the word monster. Therefore, I've given a qualitative reading. There's two ways to read Josie. Is she Munster or is she Gouda? I think that this is a swing and a Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> Alliteration and a pun. I will take the crown now. It's on my scalp. <laughs> You're hurting the bolts. <laughs> okay, so there's this lady, right? Um, I'm going to call her Lady McWoman. And Lady McWoman is checking in at the Great Northern. Yep. Uh, checking out of the Great Northern, yeah. <laughs> and she reserves two sweets. Can we appreciate and By sweets, I don't mean Krispy Kreme donuts. No, it is. I mean S U I T E S. Yes, because it's the Great Northern, as implied. At the, and at this lovely hotel, it seems that this lady, uh, I love the fashion choices because she has matching like brooch with an earrings that look very similar to door knockers. Knock, knock, Thomas Eckert yep, in talking, the house. Yeah, I think it's perfect. Like, knock, knock, Thomas Eckert's here because in the background, looming as like rooms are being set up we see a man staring into fire with his deep shade and i'll be honest with you like not to be a debbie downer here but like this episode don't don't debbie down this was in a situation where it introduced thomas eckert and wyndham earl pretty closely together in the timeline of the episode that's okay and 
I kind of feel like one of these two older men is more menacing than the other. Which one? Um, no, this is a genuine, genuine question. question it is, Earl. because here's the thing. Windham Wind Earl. Earl, yes, is menacing as it's in this dark place, as like, Leo as is being man. set up. Cooper has been hyping this dude up for so long. But this man stares into fire, and we That's have seen great. like Good fire as him. a heavy theme Hank in the show. Hank once stared into fire, too, and look what happened to Hank. And who knows? This might be the anti-Hank. I don't know. Like, this is the Kana. It's just like we don't know anything about Eckerd. We're, we're kind of being like told to care about it because this is the person behind Andrew Packard's maybe death. Not really. Mm-hmm. And then Josie connected. But like we don't really know much and arguably you could say we don't really know much about Wyndham Earl but I think Wyndham Earl's had more of an immediate effect because we've seen the bodies we've seen the corpses I think by the reveal of it alone like the heaviness it's like a very striking image I think that uh Eckerd will end up being more of like a firecracker pop and be a spectacle Mm. while uh we have this more looming presence with Wyndham Earl so again I don't mind it I think visually both are impressive and how like the colors of it invoke different but similar moves. Wait a second. Wait a second. I just remembered something. Good. Eckert has done one thing that does make him very frightening. And we found out about it through a revealing newspaper article in this episode uh, that he may be in fact responsible for a death in a newspaper article aptly titled Asian Man Killed with two exclamation marks. Now, listeners... The Asian Man Killed article, uh, which, by the way, it has specifically two exclamation points, which is like twin (laughs) exclamation points, if you will. I don't get your point. They're both peaks uh, at the end of the sentence. Okay, so? Could you clarify clarify what's so important about that? We can clarify more with uh, this very... uh, If you ever get the chance, read the whole entire paper because it is a treat. Well, you can't read the whole paper because you don't actually physically have the paper. You can read the excerpt. But let let me me read a little bit into this because it is beautiful uh, wording. Uh, So, uh, an Asian man killed. This is the article. And then, whoever this journalist is... it. Goes on to say, an immediate investigation is assured and indications are that some new light will be shed on the situation in the near future. Available facts seem vague, but authorities feel that time will disclose some means of arriving at a solution. Future plans will, of necessity, have great bearings on the situation as it now stands. It is just constantly like going back and forth, ebb and flowing with the concept of... A general thing will happen in the future, and when the thing happens, we'll have more to say about the thing that's happened. It completely ignores the Asian man that's been killed. Yes. (laughs) And then it goes like further down the paragraph, it's talking about something completely unrelated to like the Asian man, right? However, several committee chairpersons feel that the meeting is long overdue and its delay has only served to widen the gap between (laughs) those in favor and those against the resolutions that will be put before them at that time. The strange (laughs) committee, the shadowy committee, (laughs) is unsure how they will speak. So, like, (laughs) there's first the idea that, like, they would title the article on the front page of the newspaper, Asian Man Killed. That's front page news. That's what we're going to say the article. That's what we're going to do it, okay? The second part of it, not even, like, what country It's not front page, mind you. It is an article in the newspaper. It's smaller. It's cut. Thank you for that clarification. The fact that they would have this big old article on it and title it Asian Man Killed, not like what country he came from, even that'd be a little more specific, just generally Asian Man. Uh, Why would we care about some random Asian man being killed? I don't know. And what is the committee? What is going on? (laughs) He has a lot of questions if we take it seriously in universe. He's also got like this cool semi smile on his face where they got like his picture because he seems to be part of the shadowy organization. He just died like that. Maybe it's like his like uh, photo on his like license. Maybe he has one, but then they should be able to identify him and put him in this article. There are so many questions. Hey, hey, you'll have answers when we find out more things in the foreseeable future. (laughs) As events arise, we will have conclusions that we'll be able to share with the public at that time following the meeting. Okay, please, please tell the committee that I really need these answers. (laughs) Wherever Uh, and whoever they may be. And I guess the only serious thing to note, sorry, that was serious. The only... um, also serious thing that I could add in here yes. um, is that uh, Cooper does ask Truman if he thinks that Josie had anything to do with this. So there is a suspicion around Josie kind of hinted at. Cooper has been mostly an enabler in this relationship so far. And th- that is definitely a heavy question. And uh, just so you know, listeners, uh, the heavy question on my mind and on my heart was that 
What was the book Cooper was holding? What was that strange mm-hmm. Tibetan book mm-hmm. that he was holding in his hands? And I will assure you, listeners, no worries. No worries in your hearts. I dug up as best that I can, and I have found the Tibetan book. How long did that take present- you to find? <laughs> Longer than it should have, and I love it. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, effectively, I just... you want to share for the listener what it's called? It is called Tibet, a fascinating look at the roof of the world... It's people and culture. Wow. Yeah, no, and uh, <laughs> I was very happy that I actually ended up scrolling around just vaguely to bet books and eventually finding it. Have you read any of it yet? Uh, not yet, but I will. You will? Yeah. No, I, I think that maybe it might be a point. I know we'll be going through books. I won't force you through the book itself. But I, mean, I think I'd it might be down for it, but that's so far in the future, <laughs> Professor. Here we are in the future. We'll be, we'll be like in a retirement home by the time we get to the podcast Khal- that far. Khalil, I will let you know right now that if I didn't do it now, I would have forgotten it, and that would have been a crime. All right. You know what else is a crime? What is a crime? Murder. What? No. And the <laughs> Twin Peaks episode opens up on the crime scene, the aftermath of a certain murderous event. Where a bloodied bandaged man has a bloodied bandaged pawn in his bloody bandaged mouth. And I, I honestly really don't like this, but as the credits are going through, the one of the last credits on there is it says uh, so-and-so as Wyndham Merle. It says <laughs> that there's Wyndham Merle in the episode. It doesn't even I, just list an actor's name. You can't. You get the you get the role, too. You know, I would say, personally, I would... What I would end up doing, if I could, I don't know if there's any legality inside of it or anything that I would have to have extra concerns for, but I would put that credit every time Wyndham Earl is mentioned in an episode and everyone's just looking around, where is this actor? No, I think it'd be even Who funnier. is this man? They do the credits as normal, but then they only do the um, Kenneth Walsh as Wyndham Earl. They show that at the end when it's him talking to Leo at the table. So it's like the, sh- the show, the credits go... And they end. And then it just does the show as normal. And then, like, in the last, like, 30 seconds, it just says, also starring Kenneth Walsh as Wyndham Earl. <laughs> and he's right like, as he's just, like, staring at Waltzing up. <laughs> How funny would that have been, though? Uh, and that would have been a mic drop. Like, that would have been great. <laughs> that would really drive home the point that Kenneth Walsh is here. I hate play. it as much as I love it. I'll give it that. And, um... There's a, there's a lot. The professor has told me he has a lot to say about Wyndham Earl and chess, and that that does not surprise me. So let's just kind of get through the, the the bigger picture details, and then we'll get well, actually smaller people. Uh, we're gonna get through these details. How big go, is the picture? I don't even know, man. It's at least <laughs> one Mona Lisa. I need to know for my frame. It's a picture. Um, so there's a pawn chess piece in the man's mouth, and he is asked to dust it for Prince. Cooper is confident that if they lift up the shirt, they'll find one one-inch stab wound near the sternum, penetrating upwards, severing the order. He was asked, seen this before? He was like, yeah. And then along the floor, there are some lodgepole pine debris. Lodgepole. Yeah, because Lodge like I, I love the fact pole. that Cooper first guess is like, is it Douglas fir? No, it's lodgepole. You could say it's an innocent uh, sort of like mistake, but I like to think the crazy conspiracy idea that uh, Cooper just believes all trees are Douglas firs. Lodgepole. <laughs> so, you know, lodge, right? Pole. I don't know how much we need to explain why this seems strange uh the only time lodges are ever talked about in this show is the white and black lodge as far as we remember right uh well technically there's also the great northern that's lodge. not a lodge that's a that's a hotel it's a lodge okay like in the loosest sense <laughs> uh okay so whether it is a lodge or a motel point is lodges usually are associated with the white lodge and the black lodge yes the poles i think of the north and south pole and that makes me think of, like, one is on one end and one is on the other end. But there's, like, an opposition, a distance. Mm-hmm. They're opposed to each other. Hypothetically, white and black, one could argue. Mm-hmm. Um, lodgepole. So what's the difference between a lodgepole? Is that the Douglas fir? Is what? that the opposite? No, no, I'm saying that the lodge yes. is both poles. It's the, the it, north and the so south. So it is both the north and the south. I think so. The elf and the omega of trees. Yeah. The Sonic and the Shadow. (laughs) (laughs) Too much space. Too much space. Cooper hypothesizes then at this time a story about what may have happened to the man who uh, he believes had offered Wyndham Earl a lift. Wyndham Earl then did the stab-stab 
ran for a bit. The man did do. And then the car still could be there. Mm -hmm. Wyndham Earl caused the power outage, which was a diversion through the fire and then brought the body in through the window. Yes, which, by the way, he is assessing this while walking around the overall crime scene. With the lamp posting, uh, there's, a, there's a lamp that, like, shines light into the corner of the room. Yeah, and it's it, there later in the episode, too, still shining light. Yeah, in the they, of the they room. never fixed the lamp. It's just still shining light it's in the corner. It's mood lighting. <laughs> um, you know, Harry Truman is all about his mood lighting. So I have on my notes right now, the thing in all caps is his chessboard digression that uh, I believe the professor has. Hello. Uh, this is uh, chessboard time with the unplugged professor. So already we do see that there is a game of nonsense going on with the chessboard below, with some pieces in which it would not be able to make legal moves or to try to steal pawns correctly. As far as it seems that one piece has been taken away at this time, but I had a hard time seeing it. And we do get, get later on get a good view of a chessboard in Wyndham Earl's cabin where when the window opens next to the chessboard, it seems that the wind has knocked around some pieces. In truth, I believe that the chessboard itself is just pure chaos, and either how his pawn ends up moving back, or how another pawn moves to a nonsensical spot forward, I do not know how these pieces are even playing out. That was a what very long chess? way to explain IDK lol. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you No, no, it. no, no. It's not IDK lull. It is a sense that we are no longer following the rules of chess anymore. Like, there are Were we some... ever? Were we ever? I don't, I don't know. know. I'm just asking you. I mean, according to Cooper, he has played chess with Wyndham Earl every day for three years. But what rules do they play by? <laughs> After three how years do of you... playing chess, they must have developed their own system, How do you right? move forward, backwards, as well as mix around pieces? How do you do it, I've Leo? played chess one time. My entire life, to my knowledge. Is this um, the end of the story? Yeah, um, I think I lost. It was very <laughs> late at night. I don't really remember how it went. I know the horsies go in the L, right? I think that this is exactly the conversation Wyndham Earl and Cooper <laughs> have had with their chess game. Dale, the horses go in an L, right? <laughs> Wyndham, I don't remember anymore. Like, he taught him everything about the horse. I don't think he taught him anything about chess. That's true. That's true. Um... Anything more about the digression, or are you good on the chess for I'm right now? I'm digressing, saying that this is going on as much emotional logic as everything else is. Do you like that? Yeah. That it's not even playing chess right? I don't think that it should be playing chess right, and okay. I like it. Okay. So, throughout this episode, Dale Cooper is Wyndham Earl's hype man, and also his exposition dispenser. Uh, in ways that I have heard people, I shouldn't say I've heard it, I've read it, uh, a few criticisms of the episode that kind of argue that there's a show-don't-tell problem happening here, mm -hmm. where it's a lot of, like, telling us how threatening Wyndham Merle is over and over again, rather than just giving us the evidence of that. Yeah. We do get the body at the beginning, so there is some evidence, mm -hmm. but Cooper just goes on about it. So, some quotes to note here. Uh, after he leaves, after Wyndham Earl leaves, Cooper can still feel his presence in the room. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Wyndham Earl's a man who makes no mistakes, no slip-ups. Everything has its own rationale, precision, intelligence. He's a genius who has taken his first pawn in a very sick game. <laughs> Supposedly, <laughs> Wyndham Earl felt that all of life could be found in the patterns and conflicts on the chessboard. And Cooper never beat him. Well, no wonder he never beat him because he plays by these dumb rules. <laughs> And, uh, and then the, 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 the creme de la creme, Wyndham Earl's mind is like a diamond. It's cold and hard and brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it's like, cool, I get it, Cooper. You have a crush on him, but, like, leave it alone. <laughs> Ugh. No, uh, it definitely is a interesting dynamic, and mm, there's more that I want to say, but I'll bring it up later. I, I, I do think it's interesting, though, to, to question whether, from a narrative perspective, we, we like or dislike how much this is happening with Cooper. Mm -hmm. I think some of it, having having some of this sort of foreshadowy, like, exposition-y dialogue about how threatening he is, uh -huh. is good for setup. Mm -hmm. I think it's overdone. I also uh, enjoy the fact that uh, the hardness of a diamond is brought up as far as Wyndham Earl's mind, but hardness is not the same thing as durability, so who knows how they'll break in a beautiful, uh, glittery mold. I just... I was um I was recently recently watching a, a video, um, good. So I was recently watching a video um that was uploaded by this uh, YouTube channel. He goes by Jose. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to find that guy because his name is just Jose on there. I, I'm impressed that he got that in time. So that might yeah. be Hurley, a YouTuber, or just no one chose Jose. I don't know how that works. Um, but um, he does these kind of retrospective series on like sitcoms. 
and he was looking at Malcolm in the Middle. And uh, I had never seen Malcolm Middle. It wasn't a show I grew up with. So mm-hmm. I really couldn't tell you a thing about it aside from what Jose talked about in his video. I might be able to. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was talking about kind of in, I think it was the pilot episode. I think it was the pilot. That they had this part where one of the brothers who had a very like expansive history of misbehaving, instead of like telling us how much the kid misbehaved, yeah. what they did with the camera was really cool. And I feel dumb describing because it's way better seeing it. But they have this stationary shot where it has like the kid in the foreground apologizing to presumably his parents. Where are the parents? Because he's looking at the camera. And he's like, I'm so sorry. You know, I hope you can find your heart to forget. He's just like, he's this obviously fake like teenager apology spiel. So like the first time he does it, it's like, I think there's like, um, there's like a police car in the, the front lawn or something, but then it like cuts dramatically. So he's still in the exact same spot, but the backgrounds change. And now there's like a girl in the bed, like putting on her clothes. Like obviously they walked in and like sleeping with this other girl, like, okay. And then it cuts again. There's like a car on fire in the background, but it's the same shot of the guy in the foreground. I imagine making the same yeah, apology. It's still the same apology continuously. And it's like, wow, that's a masterclass and like effortlessly like, showing me the thing you're telling me. And just like, as I'm seeing it, I'm just like, yeah, I, I know more about this kid by just showing me that like 15 seconds of visuals you just gave me than if you would have manually told me, Oh, remember that one time that he, you know, Turn the car on fire or whatever. Turn the, <laughs> Turn car. the car on fire. <laughs> the he pressed the fire, fire button. <laughs> Do I want to park, <laughs> is, drive, or is flames? it ignition or ignite? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you get where I'm coming from, right? A little bit of a little bit of a. It's a good video, by the way. If you like that sort of thing, it's a good video. A kind of retrospective. But but my point is that when I think of something like Twin Peaks, which is a few years earlier than Malcolm in the Middle, yeah, mind uh, you, another space show, Malcolm still in the Middle, same '90s decade. <laughs> but um, but it's that sense in which you know that effortless showing. And I think, you know, Wyndham Earl's cunning and devastation, we can figure that out. Yeah. We don't need to be told by Cooper like five times in the span of two episodes how cunning this guy is. Hey, maybe someone missed up an episode. This was a different age of showing off a TV show. Malcolm in the Middle was the same situation. <laughs> it's not that different. No, but know. he is like, but here's the thing. Like that Malcolm in the Middle, you can jump into any episode and you can just follow along yeah. with that and it is episodic. This is more serialized then in which we're following a narrative. Sh- shouldn't that actually argue against your point then? Because that means that they put this very important moment of setting up this character in the pilot that you could have missed. Mm-hmm. Whereas Twin Peaks, theoretically, if you're like keeping up with it, you should be watching every episode. I mean, it depends on how important it is to the character and how other yeah. ways they can show it off. So I think that there's an argument both yeah. ways. My, my, my point being, though, is I guess I wish they would have decreased the amount of times that Cooper is reminding us of how cunning he is and just, I don't know, let us see it. Let us let us make our own decisions about his cunning. As you say this, I look at the disappointed face of Evelyn, <laughs> and I feel that emotion is Evelyn, shared. Eveline, I don't know. Carolyn, what? Caroline, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, they say both. I have a section here titled, Cooper Confides in Charismatic Harry Concerning Carolyn. Carol, now it's Carolyn. <laughs> Carolyn. You know, for a character that isn't shown on screen, I think that you can pronounce her name anyway. And Well, we do know. We do see her on screen. They have her, like, fading face, black and white coming in through the right side of Cooper's face. Yep. We do see an image of her. Yep. Which I think is really cool. I actually like that visual. Okay. And uh, at this time, Cooper expands upon the backstory. And I'm just going to pretty much quote him verbatim here. Um, Harry, I brought some baggage into town I haven't told you about. Wyndham Earl was my first partner. Everything I know about the law and the bureau, I owe to him. Four years ago, we drew the assignment of protecting a material witness in a federal crime. She was a very beautiful very gentle woman. Her name was Kira. She and I fell in love. <laughs> now, <laughs> who knows? There might be people who just accept like tomato, tomato for their names. Okay. Yeah, any pronunciation, just spell it right, please. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's, again, I like that visual of Carolyn's face uh, next to his, next to Cooper's sort of bruised, somber face. She has very striking eyes, almost like a whole, and like an old Hollywood vibe is what I get from the visual. I agree. And um, considering, like, Lynch's pensions for old Hollywood, Sunset Boulevard, Wizard of Oz sort of things, I think that's interesting, even though this was not a Lynch written or directed episode. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, Cooper continues, One night I failed in my vigilance. An attack was made. I wasn't ready. I was wounded, and I lost consciousness. When I came to, she was in my arms. She, she was dead. She'd been stabbed. 
<laughs> what, Professor? You find stabbing people funny? No, it's the way that you delivered it and looked straight at me as you did. So now it is funny, okay? This has uh, turned into a dramatic situation to a humorous, and I think that's good for the tone of Twin Peaks. Yeah, yeah. So Truman <laughs> understand, understood the situation, understood that, yeah, like, you mean that she was stabbed in the aorta the same way, yep, same thing with sternum, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> killer was never et cetera, found. Et cetera, et cetera, sternum, stab. yeah. Killer was never found. Cooper's wounds eventually healed over time. Windermere went mad, institutionalized, et cetera, et cetera. Stabby stab. And uh, Cooper then reveals that it's actually much worse than just Windermere blaming uh, Carolyn's death on him. No, uh, Cooper suspects that uh, Wyndham Earl had murdered his wife and yeah. murdered Carolyn, which I, I don't know, I, small little thing. I think it's weird that in the FBI, they would be assigned to protect her when it's like, would you would you assign in the FBI the husband of the wit like the material witness like because she's someone who was needing protection because she had seen a crime like yes would you assign the husband as her protector and his partner I don't know, it seems I, a little weird I, it may seem a little bit weird maybe it's just like that was a request upon her because someone that she feels necessarily close to hmm. so I don't know it just seems like a little bit of a far fetched situation not the weirdest thing in Twin Peaks by any means but I, I just. I, I'm we not, have Nadine dating high school boys currently, so like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the sort of um, processing. You're sure? That. You're yeah. sure you're not one of the FBI, Professor? He's on to us. He's on to us. <laughs> Please take him away. No, um. Hmm. Who was that? <laughs> Who was that in this hypothetical scenario? Oh, that's uh, FBI agent Bob. Uh, anyway. Oh, that's that's a concerning <laughs> name choice. Uh, See, so yeah, Cooper's got some fears that. Uh, uh, Kind of the that Earl has a sinister nature to him that Earl could be coming back, obviously, to do more damage, not just to Cooper, but to possibly people that Cooper holds dear. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as I'm hearing this, it, it's easy for me to kind of connect it back to Cooper's treatment of Audrey. Cooper had this sort of sense of guilt and weight that he did not want to get invested with Audrey because he was worried that he might bring harm by doing so. And now that we kind of have this history with Carolyn, there's a bit of a sense of, okay, we have a little bit more context for why... Uh, Cooper may feel that his involvement romantically with a woman could lead to harm for her. There is a yes. precedent. Now, when the show was having the part with Audrey in the past, did they know the Carolyn story? I don't think so. I don't think that was predetermined. I don't think that was in the script. But I think that they carried that sentiment that Cooper had a past regret. And when it came time to bring in Wyndham Merle, they could use that as an angle. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that works. Um and Cooper goes on to say that he thinks that Wyndham Earl feigned the insanity that sent him away, but he does believe that at some point Wyndham Earl lost the ability to distinguish what's right from what's wrong, and he says, you don't know what he's capable of, Harry. You don't know. And I love 10 out of 10. Amazing, glorious, beautiful. The fade-out transition from Cooper to the sort of like misty trees and low thunder yeah. of the shot following. Mm -hmm. Love it. Mm -hmm. Really good. Mm-hmm. Put that as my wallpaper. Mm -hmm. When they lock me up in the padded cell, I want every pad <laughs> to have that image. Custom pad cell. Mm -hmm. We are on our last section, Professor. Yes. Titled Cooper. 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 Not really as much to say because I think we covered Cooper throughout, mm -hmm. but a few leftover things. And we did get a DEA update, uh, mostly concerning Denise. Uh, Truman asked Cooper if he'd heard anything from Denise. Cooper basically says, in a sort of disinterested tone, that the DA and Bureau, Bureau as the Bureau. French would say, Bureau, cleared him of all criminal charges, but the suspicion still stands, mm. and he's waiting to hear from Gordon Cole. So he's kind of like, yeah, I don't know, future of my career is uncertain. Mm -hmm. he's, he's preoccupied right now, right? Yes. And Harry, you know, says to Cooper, you know, you work for me now, basically. If you want this case, it's yours. Cooper looks him in the eye and says, Harry, I want it. And um, last thing I just have on here is that because Cooper works for Truman now, Cooper does state that if you tell me to drink coffee, I'll drink coffee. <laughs> Which, by the way, can we appreciate the fact that uh, when they are just like holding coffee cups together, uh, Truman is where holding the coffee cup in such a strange manner. I've never seen someone like hold up their middle finger. Yeah, he was while holding definitely up. like flipping Cooper off. Yep, and as they cheer on to the coffee mugs, he would be facing that middle finger straight to Cooper. Uh, I don't it, think it's intentional. I think that's just the way he held the mug because why would they flip him off? Like, but why would he be holding the mug right, that I way? Think that, it, it feels uncomfortable, but I hey. Think the actor just held the mug weird. I don't, I yeah. don't, it's weird because you think they would retake the shot where like he's not flipping <laughs> off the camera. Flipping off everyone. Super strange. It is. 
I never noticed before that was happening until it was pointed out. Yes, it is quite I think wonderful. you pointed it out to me. I don't think I figured it out on my own. Yeah. Um, You're welcome. Anything else on Cooper or, I don't know, the episode overall? I'm having problems. I'm having... Um, something you want to talk about, Professor? There's something that bothers me about Cooper and Wyndham Earl, and I think that this is going to be something that is probably going to be more crazy than what I considered with Laura Palmer. Now, you know... Crazier notorious. than the auto deals that we have available at our local <laughs> automobile shop? You are familiar with how, with Laura Palmer, I was convinced with the Maddie matter in which, like... The Maddie well, matter? Yes, the Maddie matter and the Laura Palmer matter, that they may have switched places, there may have been something going mm-hmm. on with Laura in which there was a stark difference that I... Did not believe Laura Palmer was dead for a long mm-hmm. time until when Maddie died. That, that Laura Palmer and Maddie may in some way have been one and the same. Yes. Mm. Cooper bothers me because the way that he ends up talking about Wyndham Earl and his actions of Wyndham Earl and how he even like assesses something like a crime scene that he has freshly stepped in. You could say that, yes, it is make by make similar to what happened in his past, and that's where he recognizes it, and all these strange details, like the Transformer, uh, everything with the trees, etc. But after the body's discovered, Cooper seems all too familiar with the setup, and he can discern the person's history, how he was killed. During the point that Carolyn was killed, Caroline, Caroline, Cooper did lose consciousness, and when he came to, she was in his arms, dead. Mm-hmm. And Earl apparently had gone mad. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, I am still twisting around on, like, Wyndham Earl escaping from the report from Rosenfeld. And unless, like, Earl is like a parasite like Bob that needs a host, uh, and that is an idea that goes through, or if there's something else strange with the government with a separate, like, or similar Project Blue Book Mm -hmm. in which may have been involved, that that can help, that's how it can reach the physical realm. Not to mention... Wyndham Earl is a person that is known for creating woodwind instruments. And who else do we know that also has that fancy? Mm. It is also Cooper. It is so strange to see all of these things together. And it, because, yeah, Cooper has that little flute that he kind of like brings out from time to time. Like when uh, we see good old Leland driving around crazy left and right on the road mm-hmm. towards the beginning when he's carving it around uh, Truman. There's also uh, just a fun shot inside of this episode that uh, Cooper is taking the pawn from the mouth with white gloves. Uh, (laughs) White gloves are just a fun uh, physical representation of what we've seen from Leland with his bob. Okay. Um, hmm. I find that there's enough gaps in Cooper that Wyndham Earl could fit quite well with. What are you trying to imply exactly? I'm trying to imply if... Cooper is not, whether or not Cooper and Wyndham Earl might not be an extension from one another, just Mm. because it seems more than just the force that seems connected to them. I mean, Wyndham Earl, if we were to assume that he's been held, that means he's been held inside of his nice looking FBI suit with the pin as well, which is a strange sense of like physical decor that you put on a person unless he takes that on the way out. American flag pin, yeah. Very similar to someone like Cooper. He's got, uh, Cooper has knowledge that seems very fitting for someone of a more mastermind thing and having Wyndham Earl broken and also having like someone in his arms that had passed away and just conveniently around that mind gap. So are you speculating just to make sure I understand here? Cause we have seen at the end, Kenneth Walsh portraying Wyndham Earl in the cast. Yes. Do you believe that that is a Jekyll and Hyde situation of it as the same individual physically or spiritually transforming and it's the same identity, the same human person fingerprints, or are there two separate people co at the same time alive, like both alive in the same plane and universe, Yes, but are in some way soul bound. I think that at this point, getting a good shot of like people and continuity of time is difficult with the existence of Mike and Dr. Jacoby. So it's hard to say Mike? either way, whether or not this is a Jekyll. What's up? We say Mike. Yeah. Mike magic. Mike. The guy oh. who's been sitting inside the bathroom for, like, years oh, okay. until okay. they go back to him. Philip Gerard. Yes. Slash Mike. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Sorry, lost me. Continue. It's okay. So, the continuity is hard to say which case this may be. I'm leaning onto an idea that 
Wyndham Earl or Cooper is their own sense of a white, uh, black lodge before something wins out in order to obstruct the sense of purity. It is the baggage that has been left behind that has to be sorted out. Someone who is physically incarnate of the past dragging either person down. How much either person exists, I can only say likely Cooper is one who exists more simply because we've seen him interact with more characters in a sane light, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to Wyndham Earl with a rather broken down Leo Johnson. Mm -hmm. So already there's some strange mystical happenings going on in Twin Peaks that I feel crazy bringing up this point alone. But there's just so much that just is, again, filling in the gaps with Earl Amongst the cracked cup that is Cooper is... Have you considered the possibility that this is actually a prequel to the uh, <laughs> NBC, I believe it was NBC, uh, comedy show My Name is Earl <laughs> from the early 2000s? Sure, it's all about karma, you know. No. <laughs> I, listeners, so... it, 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 I'm going to be mulling around this area uh, and I probably will not be done with mulling over possibly till the end of time because I don't expect having a full answer to, to this idea. That's the right attitude. That's the right attitude to go into Twin Peaks with. Do not expect to have full answers at any given point. Yay. And that's, the, that's the show you're in for, man. <laughs> and um, I love it. I genuinely good. love it. I was going to ask you the follow-up question. Do you want your, your, your thinking to be true? I don't like, care. Do you, do you want to find out that Cooper and Wyndham Earl are in some meaning the same. As I remind you of our previous quote-unquote episode, the little update mini-sode, mm -hmm. I don't want to go forward with expectations or wants. I simply want to take this train ride and visit its passengers and learn what I will learn and not learn what I won't learn. I am simply along for the ride. You do not need anything. You do not want anything. I simply am here and I'm going to keep talking to these people, enjoying the mm. feast before me, and see whether or not uh, Pete is yelling in the background about his lack of beef weenies with the skin. Okay. I think that's a great way to end the episode, but I do know you want me to ask you a question. Give me that. my questions. So, again, ever since we had the killer reveal, it's been us reeling and looking for, for new ideas and new questions. And, yes. And uh, I hope that this one gives you something to expand upon that I don't think you've really said a lot about in this episode. So my wonderful and strange question of the week, Professor, where is Bob? If we are to assume Bob's the owl, he's just cackling and working on a few things. If we are to assume Wyndham Earl is working with these sort of bits of nature, uh, we might see him reflected through Leo Johnson. In any case, wherever Bob is, it's not good. Mm. It's not, well, it's not a fun time for anyone except Bob himself, <laughs> to say the least. He is, uh, just, just imagine the worst character to put Bob with, and the least worst character. In any case, it's bad. Okay, now I have to ask, who would be the worst character to have Bob, who would be the least worst? Okay, so the worst. Do you mean by, what do you mean by worst and least worst, just to clarify like, your terms? cause the most damage. And okay, I so think... who would cause the most damage if Bob were to go in them right now? Uh, I would say the one who would cause the most damage would be Leo Johnson. So if we see that case, okay. uh, I do not know who's going to stop uh, the barrel that is Leo Johnson. Uh, the worst candidate is Hank because Hank so far has <laughs> nothing going for him. Even if Bob did find a way, yeah. he somehow would still be foiled. And I think Bob would be very sad, be a very sad parasite from the reaction. Aww, poor Hank. <laughs> yeah, poor Hank. He'd be a sad host. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for giving us the time of day. Again, we are glad to be back uh, podcasting to your podcastable ears. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to having you join us again next episode. Mm -hmm. I say next week, but it's not next week. It's the week after. It is definitely a day in the future. Hopefully the not future. at the end hopefully of a month. Hopefully not two months from now again. <laughs> uh, we're hoping to be back for real this time. If something happens, we'll let you know. If you're ever like wondering, hey, I wonder what these people are doing. You can find us on Twitter, Snake as Eye mentioned earlier. Yep, Snake Eye Dreams 1, the numeral one, and yeah. not the Roman numeral yes. one. Yes, and if you ever want to send us those audio clips of what police cars sound like, email us. Or Twitter us. Or Well, but if you email us at snakeeyedreams at gmail.com. Yes, as an option. Until then, 
If you need us, we'll be in the darkness.